questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Twenty twenty four, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In twenty twenty four, GB News is Britain's election channel. A very good afternoon to you all. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dalby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster and all across the UK on one of the biggest days on the political calendar. Now, Jeremy Hunt has delivered his final spring budget before the general election, and he says the Tories represent the only way forward. Plan to grow the economy versus no plan. A plan for better public services versus no plan. A plan to make work pay versus no plan. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. Now, as you'd expect, Sir Keir Starmer was having none of it. And he said the Tories have lost control of the economy. Welcome to the show. Well, we've just had the spring budget. I want to hear from you. Do you feel this was the moment we expected a rabbit to be pulled out of the headlights? Instead, did it feel to you like the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, was a rabbit in the headlights? Where were the big fireworks? Where was the big bang we wanted? Titanic tax cuts instead. Does it feel like to you like they're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Throughout the course of the show, I'll speak to experts across housing, hospitality, manufacturing, small businesses, and of course, political reaction from the Conservatives, the Labour Party, and the Liberal Democrats, and the most important people of you, the great British public. Please send me your stories, gbviews at gbnews.com. Do you think you'll notice any difference to this? Will it change the way you vote at the forthcoming general elections? It was do or die time for the Conservative Party today. What's your take? Please get in touch. All these your ways and action packed show. And of course, Liam Halligan will cut through the grease as only he knows how to explain succinctly and to the point exactly what this means for you. That's all coming, but first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. First, a recap on the news from today's budget. There were cheers in the Commons this afternoon as the Chancellor announced his budget. With a mixed bag of spending and reforms, he says will let people keep as much of their money as possible. Jeremy Hunt said the government's fiscal performance means the economy is expected to grow this year by 0.8%, then by 1.9% in 2025. Promising Britain had turned a corner on inflation, he highlighted figures from the Office for Budget Responsibility, which show inflation falling below the Bank of England's target of 2% within a few months. He was quiet on forecasts beyond that point, which suggests inflation could rise again towards the end of the year. 
but he said the government will cut national insurance. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. A new ISA scheme has also been announced, aiming to encourage more investment in Britain with an additional £5,000 limit. That's in addition to a five pence cut to fuel duty, locked in for another 12 months. IT systems in the NHS will be upgraded for businesses as a change to the VAT registration threshold, up from £85,000 to £90,000. And in a move to boost the British pub, the Chancellor also extended the freeze on alcohol duty. I've decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. This benefits 38,000 pubs across the UK. And on top of the £13,000 saving a typical pub will get from the 75% 75, 75 business rates discount I announced in the autumn. We value our hospitality industry and are backing the great British pub. Well, funding some of the government's spending will be a new duty on vaping, while taxes on tobacco will go up. There's also an increase to duties on non-economy flights, while capital gains tax goes from 28% to 24%, expected to boost revenue by encouraging more transactions. The windfall tax on oil and gas profits will continue until 2029, raising around £1.5 billion. But Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says Britain's credit card is maxed out. The last desperate act of a party that has failed. Britain in recession. The national credit card maxed out. And despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. The first parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the yeah. other. Staying in Westminster, the Labour leader says more needs to be done to prevent further crimes being committed by serving police officers. Sir Keir Starmer called for mandatory standards for police vetting following an inquiry into the murder of Sarah Everard, which found her killer should never have been given a job as a police officer. Rishi Sunak said ministers acted quickly to strengthen police procedures. It is vital for public confidence that those that are not fit to wear the badge are rooted out of the police and not able to join in the first place. That's why the College of Policing has updated its existing statutory code on vetting, and that happened quickly. And in addition, the policing inspectorate, Mr Speaker, carried out a rapid respection of all forces' progress against the previous findings and, in addition to that, an entire, an entire check against the National Police database was carried out for all serving officers and staff. To the United States, where Nikki Haley is dropping out of the race to become the Republican candidate for president. The former governor of South Carolina is speaking now after she managed to block Donald Trump's clean sweep on Super Tuesday, but it wasn't enough to stop the former president's momentum. A rematch with Joe Biden now looks increasingly likely. However, Mr Trump's various legal troubles may complicate his path to the nomination. He's facing 91 criminal charges across four cases. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, we're not messing about today. We're going to get stuck right into it. Jeremy Hunt has delivered his last spring budget before the general election. And here to break it down is our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. This was a relatively low-key, unambitious fiscal announcement. It didn't feel to me like the last roll of the dice before 
a general election in May, it seems to me that the Tories are still going to go for an election in October or November. Lower taxes mean higher growth, said Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, and that means more prosperity, more money for our public service. This is a budget for long-term growth. How are we going to get that growth going? Well, the headline pre-announced, everyone knew it was coming, a 2p cut in the headline rate of national insurance from April to 8%. When you combine that with the 2p cut in national insurance that was introduced in January from 12 to 10%, the average worker in this country will be £900 a year better off. That is not to be sniffed at. Another tax giveaway is the freeze in fuel duty. Fuel duty on petrol and diesel will remain at 52.95p a litre, just less than 53p for the next 12 months. That fuel duty has been frozen since 2011, and that freeze is worth around £50 a year to the average motorists. A third giveaway, alcohol duty has been frozen for an extra six months until February 2025. It helps 38,000 pubs across the UK. Our publican sector, hospitality as a whole, has been hammered in recent years, and this is at least some help for them. More help for the enterprising Brits trying to get the economy growing. A rise in small business VAT threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 a year. You can now turn over £90,000 in your business without paying VAT. It's the first rise in the VAT threshold for seven years. Again, not too much, but worse than nothing at all. Another pro-growth measure which the Chancellor emphasised, a new British ISA, that's an individual savings account. If you want to invest in stocks and shares, you get an extra £5,000 annual ISA allowance if you invest that money in UK stocks and shares, again, trying to get the economy moving. How are we going to pay for all this, all these giveaways? One way the Chancellor wants to pay for it is by extending the windfall tax on North Sea oil and gas extraction from 20, 2028 to 2029. Companies operating in the North Sea, and they're often quite small companies, not the big oil and gas majors, are paying 75% yeah, no now on their profits. This year-long extension is estimated to raise £1.5 sure. billion, pounds, since Jeremy Hunt. But it, it won't raise that money if the taxation is so high that the oil and gas companies just cancel projects altogether. Yeah. There's a lot of anger about okay. this in Scotland, where our oil and gas industry is centred. And indeed, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives has already said he will vote against this aspect of his own government's budget. Another way to raise money, the Chancellor hopes, to clamp down on non-DOM tax status, the often yacht-dwelling foreigners who reside in the UK and they don't pay so much tax on their foreign income. That non-DOM tax status is going to be abolished from April 2025. The Tories very much stealing Labour's clothes. The opposition have been saying they want to do this for some time. It's an increase also on duty on non-economy airfares, that is business and first class. Two more measures aimed at the wealthy, trying to raise money, not to spend on more on public spending, says the Tories, but to deliver tax cuts. That is the philosophical difference between them, says the Chancellor. Vaping and smoking. Duty on vaping products is going to be introduced from 2026. It's going to be paid on imports and by manufacturers. That will be offset by a one-off rise in tobacco duty. Some people say that because vaping helps people stop smoking, there should be no duty on vaping products. That's a controversy to come. And another tax-raising me measure, the Chancellor wants to end tax perks for landlords with short-term holiday lets and other short-term rentals. This could affect everything from holiday homes to Airbnb and so on. And he, The Chancellor says he's going to implement controls to tackle local pricing out of residents when short-term holiday lets uh, are, are implemented in order to give local families a chance to buy and rent new homes. There's nothing compassionate about running out of money, said Jeremy Hunt in a jibe at Labour. We've turned the corner on inflation and we will soon turn the corner on growth. 
There were other measures in this budget. There was £5 million for village hall re renovations. There's an extension that will be welcomed by many lower-income families in the household support fund. There's £4.5 billion of money that will be raised from clamping down on tax avoidance, and that's a big risk from the Chancellor. But overall, this was quite a low-key budget. It doesn't feel to me like there's an election around the corner, and it may not be true that this is going to move the needle and rescue the Tories' electoral fortunes. Liam Halligan, excellent stuff as ever. We'll come back to you, of course, throughout the show. But let's get some immediate political reaction now to the budget and join our political editor, Chris Hope. Martin, that's right. I'm on College Green here, just trying to understand what that budget means. I'm joined now by Sarah Olney, who's the Liberal Democrat finance spokesman. Sarah Olney, how was that for Lib Dems? Well, to be honest, I thought that was a really uh, desperate budget. There'll be thousands, millions probably, of people up and down the country who are hoping to hear something that's really going to make a substantial difference uh, to the situations that they're facing at the moment. They really want to hear more about uh, investment in the NHS. They want to hear more about what the government planned to do to help them with their... 3.6 billion or so, wasn't it? Yes, but do you know that only actually reverses their planned cuts to the NHS? In actual fact, there's no extra spending at all. And I know from speaking to voters in my own constituency, but other constituencies across the country, that what people are really, really worried about right now is that they can't see their GP, they can't register with a dentist. And we know from recent reports how far behind we are on things like cancer care, which is a real worry for people. So we need to see real action from the government. And I think, actually, in terms of the economy, probably the, uh, the biggest thing we could do short term to really get the economy moving is to really tackle the fact that we've currently got 2.8 million people on the sick list. People are prevented from working because they can't get the treatment we ne that, that they need. So if the government had announced something today that could really tackle that issue, I think that would have uh, provided a great deal more reassurance to people. But we had nothing of the sort. Really, it was a very desperate budget, a very thin bu budget, and it's a government that's out of ideas. Do you believe in cutting taxes or raising them? Because they have cut national insurance by 4% in, in three months now. Yes, and obviously anything that can help people manage the cost of living, of course, we want to support that. But, I mean, don't forget, once you've factored in the planned tax rises that will still be taking place, it's not, anything, it's not a tax cut. It's really a small deduction in the amount of increase taxes that most people will be paying. It doesn't really touch the sides. When you think about uh, the increases in people's mortgages, in their rents, in their fuel bills, in their, in their weekly shop, it's going to make very little difference to most families. But inflation is not is allied to the government's control and they are freezing fuel duty. They're doing their best on cost of living, aren't they, the government? There was an interesting measure there about second homes. They're going to clamp down on, on people by, uh, being able to offset some costs from renting a second home on a short-term let. Um, is that good for the Lib Dems? Well, I mean, I think I'd want to look at that in a little bit more detail, but certainly second homes and the impact that they can have in local communities, which, uh, you know, have a big tourist industry, certainly something that my, my colleague Tim Farron in the Lake District has been campaigning on for a long time. So sounds good, but I, I want to look at the detail a bit more on that. Was this a budget for you, an, a, a pre-election budget? Are we looking at May the 2nd or sometime in November? It, it didn't feel like an election budget, to be honest with you. I mean, there's no doubt that the Chancellor is extremely concerned about the Liberal Democrats in his own seat, the seat he plans to fight at the general election, made a point of being rude about us, which we, uh, <laughs> we take as a sign that he's anxious. But, I mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think up and down uh, the country you see voters everywhere. They just want a general election now. They are sick of this government. They want a fresh start. Um, and I just don't think that, you know, there's, there's going to be much the government can really do, certainly not with this budget, to really change people's minds. And just finally, will the Lib Dems go into coalition with Labour or the Tories after an election? Well, look, we've got, uh, we're fighting really, really hard in the seats that we think we can win, uh, and we will be hoping, obviously, to return more MPs to the next parliament and to have an influence in one way or another. Well, Sarah Olney there, she's the uh, party's finance spokesman. Thank you, Chris. And, of course, that was Sarah Olney, Liberal Democrat MP for Richmond Park. Now, it's an all-action show today, and let's get straight on to somebody else who probably won't like what was heard today. And let's get the views now of GB News' senior political correspondent, Nigel Nelson. Nigel, welcome to the show. So, Nigel, we started the day with the highest taxes since World War II. We've ended the day with the highest taxes since 1948. And if people are expecting a rabbit to be pulled out of the hat, they might feel a bit underwhelmed. In fact, Sakir Sarma said today the Tories have lost control of the economy. 
Well, certainly the budget was a bit of a head scratcher. I mean, some of the things that he did announce, uh, we couldn't work out when it's all going to come in. So, for instance, uh, defence spending, and there's been a lot of pushes uh, to try and get defence uh, up to 2.5%. He says he'll do it, but not when. We've got some help for uh, childcare providers, but we don't know what it is. Um, the stuff on the NHS is not really terribly helpful. It's, an, it's a paperless NHS, but then he promised to do that uh, 10 years ago, and it still hasn't happened. Uh, and also, he stole, uh, as Li Liam said earlier, he stole Labour's clothes by uh, changing the, the non-DOM status for tax, which will raise about £2.7 But instead of using that money for public services, for the NHS, uh, he used it for a tax cut. Whether that tax cut will work, the national insurance one, remains to be seen. He didn't get much credit for the one he, he did last year. And of course, the, the key Tory demographic of pensioners, they don't benefit from this at all. Of course, Nigel, it's easy being in the opposition because you can write checks, you don't have to cash. And isn't that the point? What can Labour possibly do that's any different? Of course, Liam Byrne left that infamous note when Labour were beaten in 2010. I'm afraid there is no money, he said. Nigel, then national debt was a mere 960 billion. Now national debt is 2.6 trillion. It's almost trebled. So the big answer is it's okay for Labour to have a pop from the sidelines, but what's the rabbit they can pull out of a hat if they get into power and the biscuit tin is simply empty? Well, that, that is obviously obviously the problem. I mean, Liam Byrne was joking. That was a note left for his successor, as uh, oh, right. uh, often do. So um, the Tories then made made a lot of political capital out of it. But yes, you're right. I mean, if you look at the the predictions for debt, we're going we're heading towards 94% of GDP, according to the Chancellor. Uh, under Tony Blair, that was that was below 40%. So you can see there are real problems. And I think that's that's part of my criticism of this budget. It was a scorched earth policy. By nicking the, the Labour uh, non-DOM tax it, and paying for national insurance cuts, it denies Labour the chance of doing things that could really help people. They were talking about 2 million more uh, NHS operations, paid for by uh, uh, overtime at, at, in evenings and weekends for doctors and nurses, 700,000 more dental appointments, breakfast clubs in schools, doubling of NHS scanners. Now, obviously, all that's gone. Labour is going to have to rethink what they can actually do. But that's not what you actually call terribly responsible government. The, the whole basis of being in government is to do the best for the country. And I'm not sure that is, is doing the best for it. OK, Nigel Nelson, thank you very much for your insight. I guess that's the danger, isn't it? If you finally have a policy, it eventually just gets nicked. Now, later this hour, I'll speak to a Tory minister and a Labour shadow cabinet member about their reaction to the budget. And, of course, there's plenty of coverage of the budget on our website, gbnews.com. You've helped to make it the fastest-growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Now, if that budget left you a bit high and dry, how about this? Because it's now time for the Great British Giveaway, the latest instalment and your chance to win 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five, in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how this Wonga could be yours. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 
Now, being the People's Channel, we like to get out of the Westminster bubble. And to that end, my colleague Bev Turner has been in Whitehaven all day. And in a few minutes, we'll cross live to the town where she'll be speaking to locals to find out what they make of Jeremy Hunt's budget. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. People in this field and, and, and they talk about mental health assistance. And I know from personal experience within my own family circle mm. that the help is just not there. I know that with speaking to many families who've got autistic children and adults, they are really struggling at the moment, whether it's to do with education, getting a diagnosis. You know, once they get to 18 to 25, where's the help? There isn't the help there with social care. You know, I just set up a petition as well, who's going to look after my sons when I'm no longer around? Because that's what par that's the story and the question that's at the back of every parent's mind. It's just so hard at the moment and lots of small charities are closing. And for me, they're the backbone of the society because they're the ones that speak, you know, to parents continually all the time or autistic adults. So. And why has it to be that way? And, you know, we'll get government minister after government minister coming on and saying, we, we have greatly added to the resource here. We've had another two and a half people we've hired last year and whatever. I mean, they, they twist statistics and they make it all sound good. But I know from the work I do in the charitable world and I know from people who I, I know personally, it just isn't there. So stop telling it, it it is. And the thing is, the demand for mental health care has just woo, ballooned. Well, the earlier you start working with children who are autistic, the better the outcomes. I've seen it myself, and I know it with my own sons. I shouldn't have had to set up a school and remortgage my home, you know, for my boys. And so many parents are still struggling, like, 20-odd years from when my boys were diagnosed. And it's, they're saying it's improving, it's improving, and we're talking about awareness, we're talking about acceptance. It's hard, mm. because I'm juggling caring, I'm juggling, you know taking him to college, picking him up, you know, I'm running a charity, I'm doing events. I know I'm a workaholic, but I'm very passionate and I'm very driven. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 3.26. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, in a few minutes, I'll be joined by a Tory minister. I'll be putting him on the spot over Jeremy Hunt's budget. But let's find out what the great British public thinks of the budget now. My colleague Bev Turner has been live in Whitehaven all day. And let's go back there now. Bev, there's one thing you have to do is get outside Hi, the Martin. Westminster bubble, get away from the chumocracy, ask the great British people what they think. What have they been telling you, Bev? It's still a glorious day here at Whitehaven in Cumbria. The Lake District is just around the corner. I've been meeting all sorts of different local people here uh, today, Martin. It's an interesting town because it was built on the coal mining industry originally. So there's some beautiful Georgian buildings here, over 170 listed buildings. We were talking to one landlord earlier that was saying that's good, but it's also very difficult because it means that the houses and the properties are very expensive to upkeep. The theme that keeps coming out from today is bureaucracy, regulation, people wanting 
wanting to work hard but finding it difficult to do so because there is so much red tape that they have to get through. Obviously nothing really about that in the budget today. I have found two of those very hard working people here. This is Josh and Jordan. They are brothers and they run the Upper Crust uh, Sandwich Shop, fellas, cafe in the town. You've only been running it for a short period of time, haven't you, Jordan? How's it going? How many weeks? Uh, we've been doing it now for about five, six weeks and uh, every week's improving and uh, we're getting better every day, I think. And uh, it's just getting to get the name back out there as well. Um, but yeah, it's going very well. And I don't know whether you're familiar with the detail of the budget from this afternoon. It's one of those things that everybody in Westminster is very preoccupied by. Whereas actually, when you come out in the real world, a lot of people don't really know what was in there. Are you aware of the detail, Jordan, or what, what was said in, in the budget today? Uh, I say in bits and bobs um, about the Nandam tax and trying to raise money that way, and bits about the fuel duty. Um, and would that matter? That the fuel duty, I imagine, for you guys. It's, it, Jeremy Hunt did said, "I'm going to freeze fuel duty. I'm going to freeze alcohol duty," as though that's some sort of gift. But it's like saying, "I was going to punch you in the face, but I'm not actually going to punch you in the face." So it's a little it feels a little bit psychologically manipulative. That yeah, I feel like they're just um, last budget before an election, and they're trying to promise these things when in reality. They're, they're undoing a lot of their mistakes from the past 11 years. So, I mean. And in, in terms of your, you've had your startup costs obviously recently, but your ongoing costs as well. What's the figure that you see on your balance sheet that takes your breath away every week? Shopping. Yeah. Shopping for ingredients. Shopping, yeah, that's probably the biggest, biggest balance that we have. Um, but I don't know, that's not really in my control that either yet. Um, I don't know. But we do shop around a lot, try and get the best deals that we can. Uh, but someone's got to bring them prices down. Yeah. But and, and can I ask you why now, Josh? Why you decided to start a business now when it feels like we're in a recession, there's quite a bit of economic uncertainty? Uh, it just, the opportunity arose and rather than working jobs for very little, why not try and work for ourselves, try and make something a bit better for ourselves because you work, work so hard in your regular nine to five jobs yeah. for very little really. Yeah. Jeremy Hunt started his budget speech by saying he's giving a million pounds for a memorial to Muslims who died in the war. Does that feel like the kind of thing that <laughs> you were looking for? Well, you could have spent the money on better things, I think. Um, but it's still a nice gesture, kind of, I guess, for other Muslims as well. And in the NHS, he said in the NHS, a lot of money going into the NHS, billions, but towards a tech system to in improve the data systems as opposed to nurses, doctors, infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, you can improve the data all you like, but if there isn't the stuff to, to run the fundamental pieces of the NHS, then it doesn't matter how good your tech is, really. How have you found it getting workers? Because we hear a lot that people can't find workers as a labour shortage. Um, well, we've already had two workers there already, with the backbone of the business. Anyways, two ladies, Alan and Maz, great ladies. And, uh, but... Me and him, we're like two or three people anyways, so we're not really struggling for staff at the minute because uh, we can pick up the, the workload anyways. And uh, right now it's not mega busy, but in the future we will have to get more workers. But I think we've had a few calls in to see if people want jobs yeah. and that, but we, we can't take on at the minute because it's not that busy. Yeah. Uh, but I think people would want to work in our shop because it is a nice place to work as well. Yeah. And, it, and it's beautiful. And they've been up since five o'clock this morning, Martin. So we'll forgive them having a pint at this time uh, in the afternoon. Hardworking men. Thanks, fellas. Um, Josh and Jordan, brothers as well. And I think it's so interesting, Martin, when you come and you talk to mm. people out on the street, real people who aren't bothered whether there's going to be a tax on business class travel or whether the non-dom status has been uh, taken away from only a few, few people. Um, the other thing I've learnt from Whitehaven is a lot of people up here love GB News, so they're clearly a very intelligent crowd. Great stuff, and it's good to see the lads doing their bit for alcohol duty. Bev, buy them a pint from me. I'll, <laughs> I'll buy you one back next time you're in London. Well done, you're doing God's work up there. Beautiful stuff. Thank you very much. And, of course, Bev isn't the only GB News presenter who's in Whitehaven today. After I knock off at 6 o'clock this evening, Jubes & Co will come live from the town at 6pm, and that's followed straight away at 7 o'clock by Farage. Yes, Nigel Farage will also be broadcasting live from Whitehaven in front of a live audience. You don't want to miss them. They're always superb when they're on the road.
Now, there's lots more still to come between now and four o'clock, and I'll speak to senior MPs from the Tories and Labour to get their take on today's budget. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Tatiana Sanchez. Martin, thank you very much. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. There were cheers in the Commons this afternoon as the Chancellor announced his budget. With a mixed bag of spending and reforms, he says will let people keep as much of their own money as possible. Jeremy Hunt said the government's fiscal performance means the economy is expected to grow this year by 0.8%. Then by 1.9% in 2025. But he said the government will cut national insurance. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee, or £350 for someone self-employed, when combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. A new ISA scheme has also been announced, aiming to encourage more investment in Britain with an additional £5,000 limit. That's in addition to a five-pence cut to fuel duty locked in for another 12 months. IT systems in the NHS will be upgraded for businesses. There's a change to the VAT registration threshold up from £85,000 to £90,000. And in a move to boost the British pub, the Chancellor also extended the freeze on alcohol duty. I've decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. This benefits 38,000 pubs across the UK. And on top of the £13,000 saving a typical pub will get from the 75% 75, 75 business rates discount I announced in the autumn. We value our hospitality industry and are backing the great British pub. Funding some of the government's spending will be a new duty on vaping, while taxes on tobacco will go up. There's also an increase to duties on non-economy flights, while capital gains tax goes from 28% to 24%, expected to boost revenue by encouraging more transactions. The windfall tax on oil and gas profits will continue until 2029, raising around £1.5 billion. But Labour leader Sakir Starmer says Britain's credit card is maxed out. The last desperate act of a party that has failed. Yeah! Britain in recession. The national credit card maxed out. And despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. Yeah! The first parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. Yeah! It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the yeah. other. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or you can go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Here's a quick snapshot of today's market. The pound will buy you $1.2722 and €1.1690. The price of gold is £1,683.08 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,686 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Tatiana, for that. Now, I asked you at the top of the show for your take on the spring budget, and it's fair to say you haven't held back hundreds and hundreds of emails. And if I had to take a temperature test, I would say around about 85 to 90 percent of you are not particularly impressed by what you've heard today. Let's go through a few of them. Now, um, Simon says, there you go, that's a great start. Simon says this, as a lifelong Tory voter, and I'm 73, I will this time not be voting Conservative 
again. Brian says this. This was the worst budget speech I've ever seen. I feel like throwing my phone at the screen and I am a Conservative Party member. Um, Sue says this, lots of people writing in about pensions. Sue says this, our pensions are rising and that's good, but my rent has gone up nearly £8 a week, plus my council tax has risen, therefore it wiped out all of the so-called gains today. I think everything has been swallowed up. What a load of nonsense. There we go. And there have been hundreds and hundreds more. We'll have plenty more throughout the show. Please get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. But next, I'm joined by Bim Afalami, who's the Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Welcome to the show, Bim. So, Bim, for some reaction, um, Jeremy Hunt said this is a sensible budget for long-term growth. Keir Starmer, no surprises, saying the Chancellor is smiling as the ship goes down. As you may have heard a moment ago, Bim, the GB News viewers not massively impressed. Can you convince them why this is a great budget for the British public? Well, what I want your viewers and everybody in the country to know is that really the most important thing we've done here is to put more money in their pockets. Now, I don't expect them just to accept me telling them that. They are going to notice that in their pay packets. Let me give you an example. As a result of what we've done in the autumn statement and today, somebody on average earnings watching your programme working full time will be £1,800, uh, forgive me, average family, uh, on average earnings, £1,800 better off, an average individual about £900 better off. If they have kids, for example, if you've got uh, a, a family both working full-time, one on, say, £60,000, one on average earnings on £35,000, with what we've done with child benefit, they are going to be £4,600 better off over a year. Now, that isn't going to happen literally at this moment, but in the weeks and months to come, with inflation continuing to come down, with mortgage rates continuing to come down, and with those incomes really coming into their pay packets, I hope that your viewers will, sh will see the actions of what we've done today and that they will benefit directly from that. Has to be said, Bim, a lot of people are talking about the dreaded fiscal drag. So on the one hand, they appreciate um, fuel duty has been frozen, 2% increase on national insurance, alcohol, childcare, the rest of it. But at the same time, because the tax brackets are remaining static and wages are going up, a lot of them are being dragged into higher tax rates. And so the good law giveth and the good law taketh away. They're feeling net poorer. Well, as I said, that's why we very aggressively tried to eliminate this double tax on work, national insurance. For working people, we have, we've begun and continued the process of bringing their tax rates down. And those take-home pay numbers, the ones that I gave you, they're real numbers. They are going to feel better off than they otherwise would have done without those national insurance cuts. Now, I completely understand that people will feel, well, over the last few years, that taxes have gone up for them. And that's true. And the reason for that was as a result of the pandemic, the government spent over £400 billion supporting British people and British families. But now is the time, over the last uh, six months or so, cutting national insurance in the autumn statement, cutting it again now, getting rid of that double tax on work. This is our path to lower taxes. And we're doing this all at the same time as maintaining high levels of public services and increasing the spending in public services and also making sure that we're improving the productivity so that actually it gets to the front line as effectively as possible. We're doing all of that in a sensible, balanced way, but it's not going to happen immediately. It is going to happen with time, but they've got to stick with the plan. The economy's turned around the corner and we will deliver for them. And, Bim, now it looks like the sensible money is, forget about there being an election in May, pushed to later in the year. Jeremy Hunt flashed his garter a bit today. He said there are two types of tax cuts, NI and income tax, but he didn't give us an income tax cut today. Many people wanted that. My question to you is this. Is there a big firework left in the box? Can we expect something else ahead of a general election, a tantalising tax cut, or is today's budget, is that it? What I would say is it is uh, we are taking one budget at a time. Uh, so uh, we're focused on making sure that we uh, 
explain this to the British people. We're talking about this today. I'm not going to speculate on what might happen in the future. OK, Bim Afalami, superb. Thank you very much for joining us and explaining that to us. Thank and you're the Economic Secretary Thank you. to the Treasury. Thank you very much. Now, were you convinced by what he said? Let me know. GB Views at GB News. I'm about to speak to a shadow minister to get Labour's take on that budget as well. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello and welcome to the GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Some western parts of the UK are being treated to warm spells of sunshine today, cloudier further east and relatively chilly with a breeze from the North Sea. That is bringing some low cloud in as this high pressure to the east. Across eastern Scotland and northeast England, along with some drizzly rain, particularly over eastern hills. But further west, we've got those sunny spells, although showers are turning up across Cornwall and cloud has been hanging around for western parts of Northern Ireland. Now that edges away overnight, clear spells here, clear spells also for western Scotland, Wales and the southwest, where we do get the clear skies. Well, there'll be a touch of frost here and there and some freezing fog patches. But further east, the low cloud sticks around overnight and in fact it will be bringing a lot of mist and no, hill fog to northern parts of England and eastern Scotland. We keep that going through the morning tomorrow, but then eventually it lifts. And as the cloud lifts and as temperatures rise, there will be some sharp showers developing, particularly in an area through the Midlands, East Wales, perhaps southern parts of England through the afternoon. Warm in the south and southwest, 12 to 14 Celsius, staying chilly along that North Sea coast. Friday brings further cloud to eastern parts of the UK and some patchy cloud further west as well. But it's a drier day on the whole, most places getting away without any rainfall on Friday. Same can't be said for the weekend. Outbreaks of showery rain move north across the country, although it stays mild in the south. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's 3.46. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, at 4 o'clock, our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, will break down the budget and tell you exactly what it means for you. No guff straight to the point. But before that, let's get more Labour reaction to that budget. And I'm joined now by Darren Jones, who's the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Thank you for joining us, Darren, and thanks for sparing your time. Um, how annoyed are the Labour Party that, that the Tories nicked your non-dom policy? <laughs> Not annoyed at all, really. I mean, we kind of anticipated it. But also, it's a humiliating U-turn for the Conservatives, who until yesterday were saying that Labour's plans were either non-existent or ineffective, and now today they've adopted them. I mean, the fact the Conservative Party is so bereft of ideas that it had to look to us to come up with the proposals is quite something. I mean, the fact of the matter, as Keir Starmer said in the House of Commons today, is that if the Conservatives had adopted our policy on the non-DOM tax loophole years ago, when we first raised it, they could have had billions of pounds of extra money going into schools and hospitals in the way that we intended to spend that money but they've chosen to leave it right until the last minute as a pre-election gimmick and have missed the opportunity. 
Darren, the big question is, looking ahead, we all recall that note that Liam Byrne left in 2010. I'm afraid there is no money. And at that point, the national debt was a mere 960 billion. At present, Darren, the national debt is more like 2.7 trillion, almost treble what it was back then. So looking ahead to the future, it's OK to criticise what the Conservatives have done today. But Labour... How on earth can you afford to fund big, bold projects of your own when the biscuit tin's completely empty? Well, look, you're right to highlight that the state of the economy after 14 years of the Conservative is the worst, is the worst it's been since the Second World War. If my party wins the election this year, which of course we hope to, our economic inheritance will be the worst any party has inherited since wartime. Uh, that means that it's going to be hard. There will be difficult decisions, difficult trade-offs. It will take time to turn around. Uh, but judge us on our plans and our proposals for the country and compare that to the 14 years of failure from the Conservatives and the chaos and instability that they have exhibited that led us to this place uh, more quickly in recent years. I think that's why people across the country are looking at their politics and saying it's time for change. But then um, there's a little joke from Jeremy Hunt referring to the comments made by Peter Mandelson that Sir Keir Starmer needed to lose a few pounds in weight. And he said that the British public will lose more than a few pounds if the Labour Party get in. Of course, he was intimating to the idea that the only way the Labour Party will be able to f afford or fund big, bold projects is to increase taxes. Is that what you would do? Labour has traditionally been the party of high tax, although we currently have the highest taxes since 1948. Yeah, I mean, that's the irony, right? I mean, the Conservatives have increased the tax burden to the highest it's been in 70 years. Uh, the Scottish Nationalists are doing the same in uh, Scotland. It's only the Labour Party that's calling for the tax burden to come down on working people. And it's a bit rich for the Conservatives to say today that they're cutting taxes, when if you look at the forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the tax burden is going up each and every year for the next five years. And that's because, for example, uh, the Chancellor may have announced a cut in national insurance, but he's allowed councils to increase council tax by up to 5% a year each year for the next five years. They're just moving things around, taking with one hand and giving in with another. And I think the British people, uh, they know that and they see it and that's why they've had enough of the Conservatives. Well, if we look at the council tax, Birmingham City Council, which of course is ran by the Labour Party, has gone into insolvency. And yesterday, they imposed a 21% increase in council tax on all the residents because of their own financial incompetence. Is that a taste of what the Labour Party is to come? Well, no, because there are councils across the country of different uh, political leaderships, whether they're Conservative, Lib Dem or Labour, who, after 14 years of cuts to their services, are finding themselves in difficult positions. I mean, that's the consequence of decisions taken by Conservative ministers here in uh, Westminster. But as I say, as Keir Starmer said in the House of Commons today, the Tories are coming after your council tax now. Uh, and it's not just in Birmingham where people can expect to see hikes in their council tax this year, next year and every year for the next five years uh, if the Conservatives are elected back into power this year. OK, well, thank you very much for joining us. That's Darren Jones, who's the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Thanks for joining us. Now, let's get some reaction now from the manufacturing industry to what Jeremy Hunt had to say. And I'm joined by Fahim Khan, who is the Senior Economist at Make UK. Thanks for joining us on the show. So what do you make about the budget in terms of the manufacturing sector? £650 million was pledged. Also, the VAT registration threshold increased. But was it enough? Um, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, Martin. Um, so a few things stood out from us. Manufacturing as a sector would mostly welcome this um, budget announcement, particularly this one and also some of the announcements made in the previous one. What we have seen from the announcements made today are perhaps the initial building blocks of a potential long-term industrial strategy, which at this current moment we still lack, but we are seeing that the current party is making steps, positive steps in that direction. Two things really stood out to us today. Um, the extension of the uh, full expensing capital allowance scheme, uh, or the government intends to open a consultation to expand that to leasing. We know that about 15% of manufacturers from our surveys use uh, leasing as a method to access plant and machinery. Uh, particularly, this is all dominated by small manufacturers. So we know that that policy would potentially help um, the most smallest manufacturers access the latest and newest technologies that they need to grow. And the second thing is the um, recovery loan scheme, which has been extended to 2026, um, which will extend an olive branch to small manufacturers, but also shows the chancellor's commitment um, to small businesses to 
to understand and recognize the strategic importance that they play in local economies. And I think what's quite interesting is that they've renamed that scheme to the Growth Guarantee Scheme. So we know, which suggests that the, that the Conservatives are moving away from uh, re supporting the recovery of businesses from the pandemic, and it's now looking forward and ahead and thinking more about growth and productivity. OK, looking ahead, the Labour Party would like to position themselves as the party of small and medium enterprises. What do you think about the future if Labour to, are to get in? I think um, well, whether it's Labour or the Conservatives, it's about what manufacturers want to see. And our data shows that 99% of manufacturers want to see a long-term industrial strategy. And so actually where we need to take this as the next step is to make that commitment. The messaging has to be that manufacturing will be a priority for the UK industry. Um, manufacturing plays a significant role in the prosperity of the UK. They account for about 10% of our economy, which rises to about 20% if you include um, all the extra work that they generate by giving putting people or money into people's pockets um, they account for about 40 pounds of every 100 pounds invested in r d but really what is missing at the moment is that that kind of the messaging that says actually 10 15 20 years from now manufacturing will still be an important sector from the uk and that is what i would say that labor needs to do Great stuff. Well, a country that doesn't make anything is doomed. Fahim Khan, the senior economist at Make UK, thank you so much for your expert analysis. Great stuff. Now, before we finish this hour, I'd like to read out just a few emails. And it's fair to say a lot of pensioners have been getting in touch with us, feeling they feel a bit left out by today's budget. Anne puts it very succinctly here, saying this. Yes, they've put the pension up from next month, but everything else has also gone up, apart from the tax thresholds. And that's that dreaded fiscal drag we've been talking about. I've worked my finances coming in and out, and I am worse off now. I already had to give up my car last year. I don't drink and probably won't be eating now either at this rate. Um, somebody here, this is Linda, who says this. My annual salary is advertised at 32k, yet my take-home pay is 24k due to all of the stoppages, tax, NI and pension contribution. So that's one quarter of my salary taken away from me every single month. That's fair to say that will increase to 37% by 28 to 2029. So we're going to have the highest tax threshold in a long time. Now, our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, will be here with all the experts and analysis next. But first, it's time for your all-important weather forecast with Aidan McGibbon. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Some western parts of the UK are being treated to warm spells of sunshine today, cloudier further east and relatively chilly with a breeze from the North Sea. That is bringing some low cloud in as there's high pressure to the east. Across eastern Scotland and northeast England, along with some drizzly rain, particularly over eastern hills. But further west, we've got those sunny spells, although showers are turning up across Cornwall and cloud has been hanging around for western parts of Northern Ireland. Now that edges away overnight, clear spells here, clear spells also for western Scotland, Wales and the southwest, where we do get the clear skies. Well, there'll be a touch of frost here and there and some freezing fog patches. But further east, the low cloud sticks around overnight and in fact it will be bringing a lot of mist and oh, hill fog to northern parts of England and eastern Scotland. We keep that going through the morning tomorrow, but then eventually it lifts. And as the cloud lifts and as temperatures rise, there will be some sharp showers developing, particularly in an area through the Midlands, East Wales, perhaps southern parts of England through the afternoon. Warm in the south and southwest, 12 to 14 Celsius, staying chilly along that North Sea coast. Friday brings further cloud to eastern parts of the UK and some patchy cloud further west as well. But it's a drier day on the whole, most places getting away without any rainfall on Friday. Same can't be said for the weekend. Outbreaks of showery rain move north across the country, although it stays mild in the south. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text PRIZE to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head to head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. A very good afternoon to you. It's 4pm and welcome to the Martin Daubney Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Today, Jeremy Hunt has delivered his final spring budget before the general election and he says the Tories represent the only way forward. A plan to grow the economy versus no plan. A plan for better public services versus no plan. A plan to make work pay versus no plan. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. But as you'd imagine, Sir Keir Starmer was having absolutely none of it and says the Tories have lost control of the economy. Any notion that they can serve the country, not themselves. Yeah. Party first, country second, yeah. while working people pay the price. Yeah. But forget about Westminster because the big question is, will this budget help the Tories win the next general election? Well, the people that GB News have spoken to have given their verdict and it's fair to say it's not looking that good for Rishi Sunak. He, does, he hasn't got a prayer to capture in my vote. Uh, never, ever. But he said, never say never, but I'll say never. If you want to know what Britain really thinks, forget about the Westminster bubble. Get out there, get amongst the people, speak to the great British public and ask them what they think. I've had hundreds and hundreds of emails from you today. I want to hear more and more. Tell me your stories. Do you feel better off? Is this 
too little, too late. Were you expecting a rabbit out of a hat? And instead, you've got a rabbit in the headlights, a titanic tax cut you wanted, but all the Tories just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Get in touch, GBviews at gbnews.com. But first, let's get stuck into your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you, and good afternoon to you. Well, as you've been hearing, it was Budget Day today and there were cheers in the House of Commons this afternoon as the Chancellor made his announcement. With a mixed bag of spending and reforms, he says, will let people keep as much of their own money as possible. Jeremy Hunt said the government's fiscal performance means the economy is expected to grow this year by 0.8%, then by 1.9% next year. Promising Britain had turned the corner on inflation, he also highlighted figures from the Office for Budget Responsibility, which show inflation is falling below the Bank of England's target of 2% within a few months. He was quiet on forecasts beyond that, which suggest inflation could rise again towards the end of the year, but he said the government will cut national insurance contributions. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. Self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. So, the main bullet points of the budget for today, then. A new ISA scheme has been announced, aiming to encourage more investment in Britain with an additional £5,000 limit. Also, a five pence cut in fuel duty, locked in for another 12 months. We also heard today that IT systems in the NHS will be upgraded. For businesses, there's a change to the VAT registration threshold. That's up from £85,000 to £90,000 a year. And in a move to boost the British pub, according to the Chancellor, he extended the freeze on alcohol duty. I've decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. This benefits 38,000 pubs across the UK. And on top of the £13,000 saving a typical pub will get from the 75% business rates discount I announced in the autumn. We value our hospitality industry and are backing the great British pub. Other announcements today as well. Funding some of the government's spending will be on new duty on vaping, while taxes on tobacco will go up. There's also an increase to duties on non-economy flights, while capital gains tax goes from 28% to 24%, expected to boost revenue by encouraging more property transactions. The windfall tax on oil and gas profits continue until 2029. That'll raise, he says, around £1.5 billion for the country. But what's been the reaction? Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says Britain's credit card is maxed out. The last desperate act of a party that has failed. Yeah. Britain in recession. The national credit card maxed out. And despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. Yeah. The first Parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. Yeah. It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the yeah. other. Let's just bring you some breaking news. We're hearing from Hampshire, Southampton, actually. We're hearing a large fire has broken out at the football stadium there, St Mary's Stadium, just a few hours as well before a fixture against Preston was due to kick off. If you're watching on television, you can see smoke billowing from St Mary's Stadium uh, there in Southampton. Uh, dark, thick, black smoke as fire crews made their way to the blaze. It also, we understand, is affecting industrial units nearby to St Mary's 
Stadium. We understand 18 fire appliances at the scene and local roads quite understandably have had to be closed with that ferocious fire in play. Significant amounts of smoke in the area and if you are in Southampton or you know anybody there, people in the area advised to keep doors and windows closed until the fire brigade in Southampton can get that fire under control. Let's take you to the United States now, where Nikki Haley has officially dropped out of the race to become the Republican candidate for president. The former governor of South Carolina, Carolina rather, declined to endorse Donald Trump after she managed to block him from securing a clean sweep on Super Tuesday, as it was known yesterday, by winning the state of Vermont. But it wasn't enough to stop the former president's momentum. The time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Haley dropping out of the race for the Republican nomination. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Grace of Polly, thank you very much. Now let's get stuck into this hour. Of course, there's only one story in town today, and that's the spring budget. In a few minutes, our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, will break down the figures and cut through the grease and say how this will affect all of you. But first, let's join our political editor, Christopher Hope. Chris, now the dust has settled on the budget, as you'd expect, Sir Keir Starmer making hay, saying this, the Chancellor is smiling as the ship goes down that the Conservatives we've been speaking to seem very buoyant. But, Chris, has to be said, the reaction amongst the GB News viewers is tepid, to say the least. Yes, Martin. Well, I'm here on College Green. And with me is Paul Johnson from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Now, his verdict tomorrow will be very interesting for reporters to follow. That's the day two of the budget process. Paul Johnson, what's your verdict on the budget? Well, this was a pre-election budget from a Chancellor who actually had very little space for manoeuvre. The OBR didn't change their forecasts at all, really. And back in November, Mr Hunt was running right up against the limits, his self-imposed limits. So what did he do this time round? Well, he, it's quite a big cut in national insurance, to be fair. That's a £10 billion cut. Put that together with the cut we had last time. That's worth well over a thousand pounds for lots of people in work. So that's quite substantial. Four percent off it in th in three months. Absolutely, four percent off in three months worth fifteen hundred quid to someone earning about fifty thousand pounds. But that was the one big thing in this package. He paid for that a bit of that by raising bits and pieces of tax elsewhere. Radical change actually to the taxation of non-DOMs, um, uh, and you know, we've got a little bit even less fiscal headroom at the end of the period than we have back in November. You're spending money based on what the economy is doing in four or five years' time. Will there be a second uh, fiscal event, maybe in September, pre-November election? Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out another fiscal event. The forecast might get a bit better. The way this very bizarre fiscal rule works is it rolls forward another year, so that might give him a little bit more room for manoeuvre. So if he thinks he's going to have more room for manoeuvre, he might have another event in September or October, find another 2p of national insurance, and that begins to... Well, it's already looking quite significant, but that you know, he might help will help again. Is it the end for national insurance as, as, as a tax? Will you have one income tax in the future? Uh, well, it's going to cost an awful lot to get rid of national insurance altogether, and don't forget this is only the employee bit. There's a much bigger bit, which is the bit that employers pay on, on the pay that they provide to people. That's the big bit of national insurance. Got some very uh, but it, it's very, very striking. For 50 years, all national insurance ever did was go up as income tax came down. And now, over the last um, few months, we've had this big cut for the first time, I think, ever in the whole history of national insurance. Our viewers are telling my colleague Martin Daubney, the presenter, it's quite a tepid budget. Would you agree? Well, it's a budget from a Chancellor, as I say, who had very little space to change. I mean, look, it's worth saying this national insurance change, put it together what happened in November, is a big change. Uh, I think the problem for the Chancellor is 
everyone expected it. It was um, it was well trailed, and there wasn't anything much additional in there. I know you'll be pouring over the OBR statement when you get time to, obviously, Jordan GB News and other broadcasters. In there, it does say the OBR's for, is thinks that there'll now be net migration up to 315,000 a year from 245,000 a year as the as the as the expected figure. Is that surprising to you, given the chance that said three times they want to grow the economy without using net migration to do, to do so? Yeah, well, the OBR, of course, is just taking on the higher forecast that the Office of National Statistics provided a little while ago. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, you know, what, what this means is more people in means probably more tax revenues, but also more pressure on public services. So the very tight public spending numbers the Chancellor has announced are actually even tighter than they look because they'll have to cover more people. And just finally, the overview, the economic forecasting, well, we, we got anemic growth, but growth this year and going forwards. Yeah, nothing much has changed in the forecast. It is worth saying the last two years have been pretty grim, that national income per person has been falling for two years, and we will probably on average be a bit worse off come the next election than we were at the last election, which is pretty unusual, it has to be said. Over a whole parliament, people still know better off at the end of that parliament. The good news is the OBRs thinks that inflation's you know, down to 2% very quickly and lower than they thought before. But broadly speaking, you know, a bit of growth into the medium run, but you know, nothing like what we might hope, given how poor it's been recently. And what would you be saying tomorrow to journalists when you do your famous briefing the day after the budget? Oh, well, probably much what I've just yeah. said to you, and um, hopefully have a chance to look at some of the more detailed numbers to see uh, what's really going on under the bonnet. Well, Paul Johnson there, the head of the IFS, the Institute of Official Studies, thank you for joining us today on GB News. Great stuff, Chris. And um, a tantalising carrot dangled there. There could be another fiscal event maybe in the autumn. That's what we need, Chris, a big firework as we approach bonfire night. Superb stuff. Now, as I said a few minutes ago, our economics and business editor Liam Halligan has been looking at what Jeremy Hunt had to say and how it affects all of us with On The Money. This was a relatively low-key, unambitious fiscal announcement. It didn't feel to me like the ro last roll of the dice before a general election in May. It seems to me that the Tories are still going to go for an election in October or November. Lower taxes mean higher growth, said Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, and that means more prosperity, more money for our public service. This is a budget for long-term growth. How are we going to get that growth going? Well, the headline pre-announced, everyone knew it was coming, a 2p cut in the headline rate of national insurance from April to 8%. When you combine that with the 2p cut in national insurance that was introduced in January from 12 to 10%, the average worker in this country will be £900 a year better off. That is not to be sniffed at. Another tax giveaway is the freeze in fuel duty. Fuel duty on petrol and diesel will remain at 52.95p a litre, just less than 53p for the next 12 months. That fuel duty has been frozen since 2011, and that freeze is worth around £50 a year to the average motorists. A third giveaway, alcohol duty has been frozen for an extra six months until February 2025. It helps 38,000 pubs across the UK. Our publican sector hospitality as a whole has been hammered in recent years and this is at least some help for them. More help for the enterprising Brits trying to get the economy growing. A rise in small business VAT threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 a year. You can now turn over £90,000 in your business without paying VAT. It's the first rise in the VAT threshold for seven years. Again, not too much, but worse than nothing at all. Another pro-growth measure which the Chancellor emphasised, a new British ISA, that's an individual savings account. If you want to invest in stocks and shares, you get an extra £5,000 annual ISA allowance if you invest that money in UK stocks and shares. Again, trying to get the economy moving. How are we going to pay for all this, all these giveaways? One way the Chancellor wants to pay for it is by extending the windfall tax on North Sea oil and gas extraction from 20, 2028 to 2029. Companies operating in the North Sea, and they're often quite small companies, not the big oil and gas majors, are paying 75% yeah, no now on their profits. 
This year-long extension is estimated to raise £1.5 sure. billion pounds since Jeremy Hunt. Can I but it, it won't raise that money if the taxation is so high that the oil and gas companies just cancel projects altogether. There's a lot of anger about this in Scotland, where our oil and gas industry is centred. And indeed, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives has already said he will vote against this aspect of his own government's budget. Another way to raise money, the Chancellor hopes, to clamp down on non-DOM tax staters, the often yacht-dwelling foreigners who reside in the UK and they don't pay so much tax on their foreign income. That non-DOM tax status is going to be abolished from April 2025. The Tories very much stealing Labour's clothes. The opposition have been saying they want to do this for some time. It's an increase also on duty on non-economy airfares, that is business and first class. Two more measures aimed at the wealthy, trying to raise money, not to spend on more on public spending, says the Tories, but to deliver tax cuts. That is the philosophical difference between them, says the Chancellor. Vaping and smoking. Duty on vaping products is going to be introduced from 2026. It's going to be paid on imports and by manufacturers. That will be offset by a one-off rise in tobacco duty. Some people say that because vaping helps people stop smoking, there should be no duty on vaping products. That's a controversy to come. And another tax-raising me measure... The Chancellor wants to end tax perks for landlords with short-term holiday lets and other short-term rentals. This could affect everything from holiday homes to Airbnb and so on. And he, The Chancellor says he's going to implement controls to tackle local pricing out of residents when short-term holiday lets uh, are, are implemented in order to give local families a chance to buy and rent new homes. There's nothing compassionate about running out of money, said Jeremy Hunt in a jibe at Labour. We've turned the corner on inflation and we will soon turn the corner on growth. Superb stuff. Now, we've got loads of reaction throughout the show, but first, I'd like to go through some of your emails. You've been sending them in by their hundreds. And let's go straight to this one. Robert says, the Chancellor has given with one hand to working people and taken more back by leaving income tax thresholds frozen once again. For those who think that pensioners are well off, for your knowledge, UK pensioners are the worst paid in Europe. Something else that's caught your eye was the opening sentence of today's fiscal statement was about a £1 million donation to a Muslim war memorial. It's got a few of you somewhat miffed. Carol says this. I always believed that all soldiers were equal. We have a memorial in our town with Muslim names on it already. So why are we now spending a million pounds for a separate memorial just for Muslims? And John, on the same point, says this. I always understood that war memorials were in honour of all of those who fought in the war, regardless of faith or race. It just seems like I was wrong. And I've got one quick one to squeeze in here. Um, Enid says, I'm 72 and I'm still working. Well, done, darling. I've gained nothing from the national insurance reduction, but they lump together my pension and my part-time wage and they take tax. I don't smoke. I don't. Dr I drive about 20 miles a week. I've voted Tory since I was 21. Not again. Astonishing. Keep them coming in, please. Now, a little later this hour, I'll speak to a shadow cabinet minister to get Labour's verdict. And there's plenty of coverage, of course, on our website, gbnews.com. And you help to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. So God bless you all. Now, you could win the Spring Essentials and our latest Great British Giveaway. There's a garden gadget package, a shopping spree, and a whopping £12,345, one, two, three, four, five, in cash. And here's all the details to get your hands on that Wonga. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven, and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner, just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats, 
and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Good stuff. Now, my colleague Bev Turner has been in Whitehaven all day and in a few minutes we'll cross live to the town where she'll be speaking to locals to find out what they think of the budget. The great British people, the only people after all that truly matter. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11 p.m. Mail on Sunday and the University of Buckingham is calling out wokery at the University of Cambridge. So I guess the culture wars must be almost over then, Josh. Almost, yeah. Cambridge University discriminating against rich, white, privileged, privately educated men uh, claims... The worst which is, yeah, Basically me. Uh, <laughs> claims vice-chancellor of rival institution, which is launching a degree course on the rise of woke culture. Now, I 100% agree with this. I applied to get into Cambridge, and yeah. I didn't get in yeah. because I was too thick. <laughs> oh. oh, wow, so it wasn't the DEI mafia. No, unfortunately it was pre-DEI. <laughs> so, so it's like a double insult now. Were uh, you one of those guys who was like had a B, who was like a B average, you know? You look like you should be an A, because you act like an A. I act like an A. You act I've like got an glasses. A. Yeah. They're fake. I don't even have to... <laughs> they don't even have lenses in them. Lewis, do you yeah. think that this is... A little bit cynical, because I, I looked up this uh, University of Buckingham and they opened in 1973 and their tagline on the internet is the home of the two-year degree. <laughs> They're trying to bring down Cambridge University with this. Well, why not pick the biggest? I mean, that's <laughs> why we should why should, I, we should be attacking the BBC 24-7 on this thing. I thought we were. Uh, we aren't. We How don't mention it enough. In? What, I found, <laughs> what I found shocking about this story is Buckingham is the oldest, country's oldest private university and was founded in 1976. <laughs> Something is wrong there. What, was, what, what do you think? Was, was Oxford founded by the government? I don't think it was. Was Cambridge? No, absolutely not. I looked up no. Cambridge was 1209. Yes, so, exactly. So, yeah, so you can it get... It wasn't a government But this grant. is actually quite scary. They can do a course on the origins of the woke movement. I'm just saying, someone's going to have a degree yeah. and our job is going to be under threat. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to know yeah. much more than us. Never. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6pm. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6pm on GB News. Welcome back. It's 4.25. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, alcohol duty has been frozen until next February, and that will benefit 38,000 British boozers. But is it enough for an industry that's on its knees? Well, pretty soon I'll speak to an expert a little later in this hour. But first, here's another treat, because my colleague Bev Turner has been live in Whitehaven all day. Bev! 
Let's go there now. Well, find out what talking it was like. of treats. Talking of treats, Martin, I'm in a shop here that predominantly sells alcohol and chocolate. I am in heaven right now. And the woman to thank for that is Louise McKenna, who's here. Uh, this is the rum story. It's not just a shop, though, is it, Louise? You, you, it's a big part of the history of this town. It is, yes. So we're Whitehaven Harbour Commissioners, so we are um, in charge of looking after the historic harbour here in Whitehaven. And as part of that, we've got our shop here and um, a tourist attraction, which tells the story of rum through the Jeffersons family, um, who were around since 1785 and uh, yeah big influence in the town with everything yeah <laughs> and, and the, the budget this afternoon it's hot off the press so local people are just taking a bit of time to digest what it means for them what were the standout matters for you I mean, from a, a personal point of view, being um, a mother with children um, was child benefit. They've, they've raised it up, but they haven't changed the fact that it's a household. Um, it's almost like taxing people if they, they earn too much money. Um, yeah, you, if two people in the household um, both earn under 60,000, they're entitled to the full amount, but one person earns one, then they, they've got to only get partial payment. Um, can make a big difference, especially, you know, even high earners, they've, they've not got as much disposable income as they used to. Yeah. And, and as a business here, what are you finding difficult? Was there anything in the budget today to help small businesses? Not a lot. Not a lot, no. I mean, the frozen alcohol duty, which, you know, it did... The, the, there was a lot of sort of up and that um, a couple of months ago anyway. Well, so they didn't reduce it, though. They did not reduce it, no. They've stuck the same, but we're still looking a lot higher than we were even just a couple of years ago, um, especially because we predominantly stock small independent um, distillers. It, it, it's a lot of money for them. Um, it's really encouraging people um, to go to the supermarkets rather than support small local businesses. Is, um, yeah, we haven't had much help there. <laughs> no, and, and what, what are the challenges for you as a small business here in a, a small northern town? Um, the people here seem to be very keen to support local businesses. Um, yeah, I really do think so. Um, we still get a lot of people through. There's still a lot of people that like to come in and touch products. Um, it's not all online. Everybody keeps going on about online. Um, it really does help small businesses if you can use our online side. But actually physically coming down and buying something from a shop is the biggest support anybody can give. Yeah. And you've got all this beautiful architecture in this town, but it looks like it's hard work to maintain because so many listed buildings. Yes, I mean, um, we our attraction is in a really big building. It extends right back um, a fair few hundred metres. <laughs> well, yeah, not quite that, but um, we've got a lot of roof up there. And yeah, on a listed building, it is, oh, it's really hard to maintain. It's really hard to get the funds to keep it, you know, watertight. Um, we get a lot of adverse weather here on the coast. So yeah, a little bit of help would be... Yeah. It would be much appreciated yeah. with listed buildings. Well, I mean, your produce is amazing, and I am going to go home with a bag full. Uh, don't worry. Um, I've, I also want to bring in Graham here. So Graham Roberts is a local councillor, one of those people that communities really need. Graham, thank you for what you do for the people of Whitehaven here, um, and you've put years into supporting this town. What do you see as the challenges, and is this government helping? I think the challenges are immense. Um, I don't see that the government are helping because the rigmarole we have to go through to draw down cash to mend a town like this, and I will use the word mend, very difficult. I think we're absolutely strangled in this country with red tape. Absolutely. And you're an independent councillor now, but it wasn't always that way. What happened? Well, um, I fell out of love with the Conservative Party because I believe they've lost their mojo. I think they're going in a direction that they don't understand, the public certainly doesn't understand it, and they're not there now for the benefit of the country. Who are they there for the benefit of then? Because if they were here, they would say, Graham, we're doing what we can, you know, we're <clears throat> we have a huge deficit, we can't reduce taxes, we've reduced national insurance from 20% uh, to, uh, eight, sorry, from 10% to 8% today. But what else could they do? Well, I think they should create a ministry of waste because the amount of waste that goes on in London, and I go to London regularly, and I see the lights on in the offices at late at night in Whitehall, burning away, that's the first starting block of what I would do. Yeah. 
the Chancellor really needs to look at a Ministry of Waste. How do you think it might look for them in the next election then? I think they're going to struggle. I think the red wall seats are really, really a problem for Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you had high voter turnout in this town, actually, in the last election. It was something like 70%, which is remarkable. So it's quite a politically engaged town. A few people I've spoken to this time say, no point voting, nothing changes. Well, if you don't vote, nothing will change. And I think that the public here are very astute. And I love them all. I've got some great friends and great voters in this area. And I believe that they will let you know what they want and how they want it. OK, Graham. Well, I think you speak for a lot of the British public there. We had another interviewee earlier who called them the Con-Socialist Party, uh, Martin. But that beating heart of the North wanting to work hard, wanting to make a living and have a purpose and not just sit at home and wait for benefits, but feeling that the government are not helping them in quite the right areas. Uh, don't forget, Michelle and Nigel Farage will be broadcasting live from Whitehaven this evening. I will see you later. Superb stuff, Bev. And please tell Graham that many, many of our viewers agree with him. And please get me a bottle of rum from there. The rum story, that's one I'd like to hear. And I don't suppose I'd remember the ending. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Bev, as you just mentioned, isn't the only GB News presenter that's on tonight in Whitehaven after I knock off for the evening. Jubes & Co from 6 till 7 will come live from the town. And following that, it's the big event, 7 o'clock. It's Farage. Nigel Farage live broadcasting from Whitehaven in front of a live audience seven till eight you will not want to miss that there's loads more to come between now and five o'clock i'll be joined live by a shadow cabinet minister to get labor's take on today's budget plus an expert on the pub sector but first make sure ladies news headlines with polly middlehurst The top stories this hour, well, in today's spring budget, a mixed picture of spending and reforms and the Chancellor saying he's going to try to let people keep as much of their own money as possible. Jeremy Hunt said the government's fiscal performance means the economy is expected to grow this year by 0.8%, but he said the government will cut national insurance contributions. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. Well, aside from the big news on national insurance contributions, a new ISA scheme has also been announced, aiming to encourage more investment in Britain, with an additional £5,000 limit to it. And that's in addition to a five pence cut to fuel duty. That's locked in for another 12 months. In another move from the Chancellor, IT systems in the NHS will be upgraded. And for businesses, there's a change to the VAT registration threshold. That's up from £85,000 to £90,000 a year. And in a move to boost the British pub, the Chancellor also extended the freeze on alcohol duty. Now, funding some of the government's spending will be a new duty on vaping, while taxes on tobacco, we understand, will go up. There's also an increase to duties on non-economy flights, while capital gains tax goes from 28 to 24 per cent. That's expected to boost revenue by encouraging more transactions in investments. The windfall tax on oil and gas, profits that is, will continue until 2029. That does raise around £1.5 billion for the government, but the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, said Britain's credit card is already maxed out. The last desperate act of a party that has failed. Yeah. In recession, the national credit card maxed out, and despite the measures today, the highest tax burden for 70 years. The first parliament since records began to see living standards fall, confirmed by this budget today. That is their record. It is still their record. Give with one hand and take even more with the other. 
Those are the latest news headlines. For all the top stories, sign up for GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Well, how have the markets reacted to today's spring budget from the government? Well, I can tell you that the pound will buy you $1.272. It will also buy you €1.169. Gold is £1,683.08 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day at 7,686 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Sort of six till seven. Now, it's fair to say that I'm a fan of the British Beer and Pub Association, so much so I was rabbiting away to the chief of it there. And I'm going to speak to someone from the organisation in a few minutes' time to see if the budget has helped pubs across the country. Let's see what she makes of this budget. Emma McLaughlin and I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. I'm Nigel Farage and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Well, we've been a constitutional monarchy since the late 17th century. And of course, part of that deal is that the monarch or indeed the close immediate royal family should not interfere with politics that in any way could be seen to affect individual Parties. Now, perhaps one of the most classic cases in the 20th century was Edward VIII, who during his brief reign went down to Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, met thousands of people who'd lost their jobs in the steel industry. In fact, he shook so many hands in the end, he had to change and shake with his left hand. And he said something must be done to get these people jobs. It was taken as a direct assault on the Conservative government of the day. And we could go on to Edward Heath, as many saw it, using the Queen to get us to join the common market and things the Queen said uh, during the referendum on Scottish separation. And we could, of course, could talk about King Charles, who was Prince of Wales, endlessly talked about climate change and net zero. But the intervention overnight from Prince William, I think, is the most direct Political, a political piece of interference that has international and global implications that I almost think we've ever seen. Prince William is saying to Israel, stop what you're doing. Some will see that as being given a free pass to Hamas. Many young people will say, hooray, he's doing the right thing. But whether he's doing the right thing or not, has he gone just too far with this? Should our future king intervene in this way. I don't believe that he should. I think he's making a very big mistake. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 4.40. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, later in the hour, I'll speak to a mortgage expert, see what today's budget means for homeowners. But before that, 
The Chancellor announced an extension of the alcohol duty freeze until 2025 in that spring budget earlier on today. Now, Jeremy Hunt says that extension will benefit 38,000 pubs across the UK. Well, I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Emma McCorkin, who is the Chief Executive of the British Beer and Pub Association. I've got job envy, for starters. So, a freeze on alcohol duty, um, is that the you know, large measure that you wanted or do you feel a bit short-changed by Jeremy Hunt's budget today? Well, listen, we'll take no further increases. Uh, a duty freeze is welcomed by brewers and pubs and consumers alike, but it is valued about £114 million, but we're looking into the face of a cliff edge of increase due to wage increases and business rates of £450 million in April. So it's only gone a very small way into covering those cost pressures that we're under. So it, it was a bit disappointing from that perspective that they didn't give us what we wanted. And what did we want? Cuts. Mm. Cuts that would have meant we could have reduced the cost of a pint, reduce the cost of running our pubs and be able to grow and continue being the beating heart of our communities. And Emma, I know you've been fighting tirelessly since the very beginning of lockdowns. Hospitality, of course, was hammered. It was really, really under the cosh. And indeed, a really sobering statistic here. More pubs closed in the first half of last year than the whole of 2022. And simply landlords are struggling with the soaring costs of supplies, of food, of energy and wages. So a cut would have given them some wiggle room. But is this enough? Uh, the reality is, is that these cost pressures keep mounting on businesses. We saw 530 pubs close their doors for good last year, an acceleration um, in the amount of pubs closing their doors. And this is something we want to see close and, uh, sorry, stop um, and the closure and, and see that there is going to be this period of stability for the sector where they can recover. They can keep helping invest in people and places, which they do. But the reality is this budget, unfortunately, doesn't touch the sides of the taxation burden that they're under. And so the reality is we could be looking at, again, 500 to 600 pub closes this year when the opportunity could have been missed. But I do hope that the public will swing behind it, mm. perhaps with that NI cut in their pocket. They'll feel that they can go out and have that extra pint. And my goodness, their local will need it. And pubs, of course, aren't just a place where you get a drink, especially in villages, in towns. They're a place where people go to have company, to stay warm, to keep in control and in touch with the community. The great British pub is a part of the fabric of our nation. And it's not just somewhere where you go for a pint. I absolutely agree with you, Martin. Pubs really matter. That's why I do my job and I'm so passionate in fighting and making the argument. And we made the case very clearly to government that we needed more. We needed more support in business rates. We needed more support in VAT to keep the Great British Pub alive. It is an economic activator. It is a multiplier on the high street. But more than that, it's that social value, that cultural value it brings to our societies that will be so much poorer without. So I hope that in the next fiscal event, maybe happening in a few months, Months, they will think again on what they can really lean into to back British pubs. Super. Thank you very much. We'll all drink to that. Emma McClough, being Chief Executive of the British Beer Pub and Beer Association. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio. Now, let's get some more Labour reaction to that budget. And I'm joined now by Jonathan Reynolds, who's the Shadow Business and Trade Secretary. Jonathan, welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure. So, Good no afternoon. surprises, Keir Starmer was saying that the Chancellor is smiling as the ship goes down. The public will recognise this Tory con. The Tories have lost control of the economy. Is that mainly because he's angry that the Tories stole your non-dom tax idea? <laughs> well, yeah, first of all, I mean, 14 years, the culmination of, of total failure, to be honest. I mean, here we are, 14 years of Conservative government, the tax burden still going up at the highest level ever, business investment, the lowest in the G7. Living standards going backwards. I mean, that is the test that people will apply to it. Are you fair to say, yes, we've been robbed a little bit of, of some of our policies? Look, that, that can happen when you're winning the argument and everything a lot of Conservative MPs have said about that change to the non-DOM policy. They'll now have to eat their words. But just imagine if they had done it five or six years before. And think of the revenue for public services or for, for taxes that that could have brought about. And so, look, the, the, the duty, the burden will be now on us to 
recognised that we were going to put that money to the NHS, into emergency dental care in particular. We're going to have to go and find an alternative to that because we still believe that need is there. But we don't do that immediately after we've had something stolen. We'll have to go away and think about that properly. But uh, doesn't it tell you everything, that the big picture is as dire as ever, but the only interesting things are the things the government are stealing from the opposition. Can I quickly ask you, Jonathan, about the money that you'd have left, the wiggle room that the Labour Party would have if you were to get into power? Liam Byrne, of course, famously left that letter. There's no money left. But the national debt then, in 2010, was a mere $960 billion. Now the national debt is $2.6 trillion. It's almost trebled. So it's all fair and well for the Labour Party to say no, we would do things better. But where would you get the money from? The country is potless. The biscuit tin is empty. Yeah, you're right to say it feels like the Chancellor's operating a sort of scorched earth policy, you know, and it's not responsible and it's not in the national interest. And of course, I regret that. But of course, there's still an election to have. I think the, the attitude they're adopting is not the right one. Look, we've got some of our revenue raises still in place. We'll change the taxation of uh, private schools in the United Kingdom. We will, for instance, make them pay VAT in business rates. We have a change to how private equity income will be taxed and we'll have to find an alternative to this non-dom policy. And it's also important to say, actually, our, our fiscal rules are much tougher on day-to-day -day spending, and that's why that's, those policies are in place. But they do allow a bit more of investment spending, and that's really important to get the economy growing. But yes, look, it's also important, though, I think, to say what we really need to see the British economy work better. It's not all about spending. I mean, planning and building homes, that's a big part of what we'll do differently to the Conservative Party. Um, how the skills system works, the apprenticeship levy, letting businesses spend more of those funds, their own funds, on upskilling their workforce, improving their deal with the European Union, which will make the economy grow faster, having stronger employment rights. I mean, there are other things that we can do, but we've also got those switch spends in place, and it's the aggregate effect of all of those which we believe will give people better living standards, a faster-growing economy, and better public services. So, Jonathan, it sounds like the only way, then, is to increase taxes. Jeremy Hunt said today the Labour Party will be a party of increased taxes and made a joke. Peter Mandelson, of course, advising Sir Keir Starmer to lose a bit of weight. And then he joked that they were the British public that lost a few pounds if the Labour Party was to get in power. Well, I mean, the facts remain that the Conservative Party has put the tax burden up to the highest ever level in British history, so it's a little bit rich to criticise other people. If you look at the aggregate effect of the tax changes announced uh, in this Parliament, people are paying higher taxes today than when the Parliament was formed in 2019. The national insurance cuts are only giving you back maybe half of the increase you've already had to suffer through the tax thresholds being frozen, through higher council taxes, the government puts more of the burden of things like social care onto the council tax burden. And people know this. I mean, people aren't stupid. They know they're not better off. And it's a tragedy that that's the reality after 14 years of Conservative government. But that is the case. And I think, you know, a little bit of self-awareness and humility from the Conservative Party probably is necessary there. But also, you know, the things, the other things, those things I've just said are necessary to get the economy going faster. They can't deliver those things. You're never going to get stronger employment rights and a better relationship with Europe and public investment to tackle net zero from the Conservative Party. If they were going to do that, they'd have done it already in the last 14 years. OK, thanks for joining us. Jonathan Reynolds is the Shadow Business and Trade Secretary. Thanks for your Thank time. You. It's always a pleasure. Now, moving on, more than 14 million people in the UK have mortgages, many of whom have been hit by high interest rates, of course, and the Chancellor trailed a 99% mortgage scheme, stamp duty relief and lifetime ISA help whilst earlier pledging to build homes for young people. But he failed to mention any of the above in his budget today. So... Does the Chancellor care about British housing? And to discuss this, I'm now joined by Sally Mitchell, who's a senior mortgage broker at The Mortgage Mum. A fantastic name, and you're always a great guest. Sally, a lot of people saying the same thing today. Um, housing, a huge issue, particularly young people who seem the dream of home ownership is constantly out of touch, and yet nothing today, Sally, in that budget for homeowners or those hoping to get on the ladder. Yeah, I was underwhelmed. Um, I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised because the budget was touted, and he said it many times, a budget for long-term growth. And I do appreciate that we're not exactly awash with buckets of cash, but it is such a shame that the opportunity wasn't taken to, to really help those particularly first-time buyers who need to get onto the property ladder and, and unwise, because I think that's the part of the electorate 
that the Tories really want to, you know, bring over to their side. And they 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 could have done something really special just to help. First time buyers are the lifeblood of the property market. Um, I heard something the other day that you know, bees, without bees, our ecosystems will fail. Um, well, without first-time buyers, the whole property market just doesn't really rotate. It doesn't revolve. So we need them in at the ground level. And so what would you like to see? Um, stamp duty cuts or incentives to buy? And let's not even get started on nimbyism, the absolute failure, the lack of building of housing out there. I know. I mean, he did. He did say that he had promised another million houses, and um, it does look like there's a lot of development around there. But the reality is, when it comes to this, it is nimbyism. No one wants it in their backyard. But also, the whole planning um, system is archaic and it's not working. There's a whole lack of actual planning inspectors um, around, so things don't get pushed through. They make it unnecessarily difficult for people to improve their homes and to build new homes. Um, and it's it's really, really difficult. I would have liked to have seen a little help on stamp duty. I really would, because the average deposit for a first-time buyer is over 55000 Now. I don't know about you, but I would find that incredibly difficult to save up for, um, especially if you're renting and we know that rents are incredibly high at the moment. So how people are meant to get that together, I don't know. And Sally, something that was mentioned three times by the Chancellor of the Exchequer today was net migration. And of course, that is an issue when it comes to the housing market, simply because it's a matter of supply and demand. And yet we see the figures through the roof, 745 net thousand this year. And of course, irrespective of your opinions on net migration, say that chokes off supply and it pushes up prices. It does, which is why inflation is proving to be really sticky. Um, and we've got higher interest rates with the Bank of England base rates sticking uh, because we cannot get a grip on inflation. So it, it is um, not a vicious circle, but it's you can see how everything is interacting and, and related. So we've really got to get that inflation figure down. Um, some people say that you can trace this this service side of the economy, this this uh, downgrade in the service side of the economy all the way back to Brexit. So, you know, it, it's been going on for a very long time. Yes, and thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Sally Mitchell, who's a senior mortgage broker at The Mortgage Murmur. I just love the name of your company. Thank you very much for <laughs> joining us. Now, we've got loads of emails to go through. I ask you for your responses throughout the show, as well as Bev being in Whitehaven. You've been getting in touch in your droves. And that topic there of immigration comes up quite a lot. But before that, this really resonated with me as too. Um, Christine said this, I was so disappointed by the behaviour of some MPs while Jeremy Hunt was giving his budget speech earlier on. They were shouting like spoilt children. What kind of example is this setting for the younger generation? No wonder teachers are struggling to keep pupils quiet in the classroom if children are being raised to learn that it is OK to shout back. And Christine, one MP was told four times to stop shouting, and if he carried on, he'd have been given the boot. Linda adds this. I'm sorry to have to bring this up, but the question of illegal immigrants being given everything from houses, flats to clothing, phones, when the average person is struggling to pay high rents. All of this is paid for by the taxpayer. This is the most important thing to me, as I worry for my grandchildren with this huge influx of unchecked people. And none of this at all was addressed in this budget today, and it should have been. And Jimmy says this quickly, I don't drink, I don't smoke, but there's been absolutely nothing in the budget for me, despite the fact that I pay thousands and thousands in tax. Donald quickly adds this. Absolutely nothing for pensioners. Most of us pensioners vote Conservative. Hunt has just given us all a very good reason to vote Reform UK. And quickly, um, Peter says, I'm a pensioner. The last two pension increases were massive. What more do you want? So Peter is happy about that. Now, in a few minutes' time, I'll be joined by our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, who will cut through all the grease to give you the juice. But before that, it's time for your latest weather forecast with Aidan McGiven.
A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Some western parts of the UK are being treated to warm spells of sunshine today, cloudier further east and relatively chilly with a breeze from the North Sea. That is bringing some low cloud in as this high pressure to the east. Across eastern Scotland and northeast England, along with some drizzly rain, particularly over eastern hills. But further west, we've got those sunny spells, although showers are turning up across Cornwall and cloud has been hanging around for western parts of Northern Ireland. Now that edges away overnight, clear spells here, clear spells also for western Scotland, Wales and the southwest, where we do get the clear skies. Well, there'll be a touch of frost here and there and some freezing fog patches. But further east, the low cloud sticks around overnight and in fact it will be bringing a lot of mist and oh, hill fog to northern parts of England and eastern Scotland. We keep that going through the morning tomorrow, but then eventually it lifts. And as the cloud lifts and as temperatures rise, there will be some sharp showers developing, particularly in an area through the Midlands, East Wales, perhaps southern parts of England through the afternoon. Warm in the south and southwest, 12 to 14 Celsius, staying chilly along that North Sea coast. Friday brings further cloud to eastern parts of the UK and some patchy cloud further west as well. But it's a drier day on the whole, most places getting away without any rainfall on Friday. Same can't be said for the weekend. Outbreaks of showery rain move north across the country, although it stays mild in the south. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £45 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery. And I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
A very good afternoon to you all. It's 5 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dorby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK on one of the biggest days on the political calendar. Jeremy Hunt has delivered his final spring budget before the general election, and he says that the Tories represent the only way forward. A plan to grow the economy versus no plan. A plan for better public services versus no plan. A plan to make work pay versus no plan. Growth up, jobs up, taxes down. But as you'd expect, Sakir Starmer was having absolutely none of it and says the Tories have lost control of the economy. But any notion that they can serve the country, not themselves, yeah. party first, country second, yeah. while working people pay the price. Yeah. And the big question is, will this budget help the Tories win the general election? Well, the people that GB News has spoken to have given their verdict, and it has to be said, it's not looking good for Rishi Sunak. I'm bringing these things forward just just because the election might be coming up. But it does not really for working man or our NHS or things what people need. You know, if, if you want to know what people really think, get out of the bubble, get out of Westminster, speak to the great British public. What do they make of the pantomime of the budget? They see through it. They see that they're not feeling particularly better off and they gave us everything today when we went to see them in Whitehaven and hundreds of emails from you. We've got so much more to come between now and six o'clock in a few minutes. Our economics and business editor Liam Halligan will give us his expert analysis of the budget and cut through the grease. But first, we can hear from the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, this is a budget that will grow the economy uh, by delivering better public services. It means people will have to wait less long to see a doctor, get their cancer scans back more quickly, and also brings down taxes, which will fire up the economy. It puts uh, £900 in someone on the average wage if you combine it with the national insurance cuts in the autumn. And the choice when it comes to an election is between a party that believes the way we get the economy going is to bring taxes down, or the way that you get the economy going is to spend more. And Conservatives believe that lower tax economies are more dynamic, uh, and that is the big choice that people will have this year. But polling actually suggests that people don't want tax cuts, they, they want more money for public services. What do you say to those voters who fear this budget is baking in more cuts to services? Well, we've invested nearly £6 billion more in the NHS this year. That means that people are going to wait less long for a doctor's appointment. Uh, they're going to get their scan results back more quickly. It's going to save a lot of lives. It's going to make the NHS more efficient. Um, and we set out a plan that is going to make all our public services better and more efficient. So it's a budget for better public services. But it's also a budget that recognises if we want to have a, a rapidly growing economy, create jobs for the future, we need to bring down taxes. And we'll do so in a responsible way, which is what we've done with the national insurance cuts that mean an extra £450 for someone on the average wage. There were no rabbits out of the hat in this budget. Is, it, is that the lasting legacy of Lidge's trust? You're too scared of spooking the markets, you'd rather underwhelm them instead. This was a very significant budget in two ways. We've shown that we can continue to cut taxes in a way that makes a real difference to people's family budgets. Uh, combined with the autumn, it's an extra £900 in people's pockets uh, if they're on the average wage from the national insurance cuts and make public services better at the same time. A big transformation plan for the NHS uh, to help the police cut crime, uh, to help our schools be run more efficiently. So it's a budget that protects public services, brings down taxes and helps grow the economy. But fiscal drag actually means that even with your national insurance cuts, most workers will be worse off than they would have been had thresholds just risen with inflation. Are you planning to raise those thresholds anytime soon? 
even after you take account the impact of thresholds, uh, what you see is that after a four percentage points cut in national insurance, there is a big reduction in the tax bill for ordinary families. And, and that is because the economy has turned a corner. We've stuck to the plan we have. Uh, the forecasts are much more optimistic for the economy going forward. And as Conservatives, we believe that if we bring down the tax burden, that will fire up the economy, create more jobs, more money for public services like the NHS. One more quick one. One of your ministers has described your measure to extend the oil and gas windfall tax as deeply disappointing. Will he keep his job? Well, he is a Scottish MP, and you know, I understand there are local concerns. We'll be engaging with the oil and gas industry to talk about those concerns. But given that prices following the invasion of Ukraine have lasted much longer than anyone predicted at the time. I think it's fair that the oil and gas industry should make an additional contribution to the amount of money that we have been having to spend on cost of living support. Thank you. And, and as you'd imagine, he's standing by his guns. But let's crunch the numbers in the last, the last spring budget now before that general election. And here to break it down for you, what it means for the pounds and the pence in your pocket is GB News' economics and business editor Liam Halligan with On The Money. This was a relatively low-key, unambitious fiscal announcement. It didn't feel to me like the roll, last roll of the dice before a general election in May. It seems to me that the Tories are still going to go for an election in October or November. Lower taxes mean higher growth, said Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, and that means more prosperity, more money for our public service. This is a budget for long-term growth. How are we going to get that growth going? Well, the headline pre-announced, everyone knew it was coming, a 2p cut in the headline rate of national insurance from April to 8%. When you combine that with the 2p cut in national insurance that was introduced in January from 12 to 10%, the average worker in this country will be £900 a year better off. That is not to be sniffed at. Another tax giveaway is the freeze in fuel duty. Fuel duty on petrol and diesel will remain at 52.95p a litre, just less than 53p for the next 12 months. That fuel duty has been frozen since 2011, and that freeze is worth around £50 a year to the average motorists. A third giveaway, alcohol duty has been frozen for an extra six months until February 2025. It helps 38,000 pubs across the UK. Our publican sector hospitality as a whole has been hammered in recent years, and this is at least some help for them. More help for the enterprising Brits trying to get the economy growing. A rise in small business VAT threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 a year. You can now turn over £90,000 in your business without paying VAT. It's the first rise in the VAT threshold for seven years. Again, not too much, but worse than nothing at all. Another pro-growth measure which the Chancellor emphasised, a new British ISA, that's an individual savings account. If you want to invest in stocks and shares, you get an extra £5,000 annual ISA allowance if you invest that money in UK stocks and shares. Again, trying to get the economy moving. How are we going to pay for all this, all these giveaways? One way the Chancellor wants to pay for it is by extending the windfall tax on North Sea oil and gas extraction from 20, 2028 to 2029. Companies operating in the North Sea, and they're often quite small companies, not the big oil and gas majors, are paying 75% yeah, no now on their profits. This year-long extension is estimated to raise £1.5 sure. billion pounds since Jeremy Hunt. But it won't raise that money if the taxation is so high that the oil and gas companies just cancel projects altogether. Yeah. There's a lot of anger about okay. this in Scotland, where our oil and gas industry is centred. And indeed, the leader of the Scottish Conservatives has already said he will vote against this aspect of his own government's budget. 
Another way to raise money, the Chancellor hopes, to clamp down on non-DOM tax staters, the often yacht-dwelling foreigners who reside in the UK and they don't pay so much tax on their foreign income. That non-DOM tax state is going to be abolished from April 2025. The Tories very much stealing Labour's clothes. The opposition have been saying they want to do this for some time. It's an increase also on duty on non-economy airfares, that is business and first class. Two more measures aimed at the wealthy, trying to raise money, not to spend on more on public spending, says the Tories, but to deliver tax cuts. That is the philosophical difference between them, says the Chancellor. Vaping and smoking. Duty on vaping products is going to be introduced from 2026. It's going to be paid on imports and by manufacturers. That will be offset by a one-off rise in tobacco duty. Some people say that because vaping helps people stop smoking, there should be no duty on vaping products. That's a controversy to come. And another tax-raising me measure, the Chancellor wants to end tax perks for landlords with short-term holiday lets and other short-term rentals. This could affect everything from holiday homes to Airbnb and so on. And he, The Chancellor says he's going to implement controls to tackle local pricing out of residents when short-term holiday lets uh, are, are implemented in order to give local families a chance to buy and rent new homes. There's nothing compassionate about running out of money, said Jeremy Hunt in a jibe at Labour. We've turned the corner on inflation and we will soon turn the corner on growth. So what are the major political parties made of this budget? Well, let's cross now to our political editor, Chris Hope. Chris, welcome back to the show. So no surprises, the Chancellor of the Exchequer standing by his guns. No surprises again that the Keir Starmer is saying that the Chancellor is smiling as the ship goes down. But Chris, what struck me has been the reaction from the GB News viewers. And they're very, very canny, very, very switched on. They get that a 2% cut on NI helps them, but they also get that fiscal drag isn't helping them. People expected today, Chris, a rabbit to be pulled out of a hat. Instead, they feel like the Chancellor was acting like a rabbit in the headlights, that maybe the budget's a bit too timid, a bit too lame. Yeah, and that word tepid, Martin, hello again from College Green, that's right, tepid was the word which some viewers used. Um, to me, the lesson, the political lessons from this are quite interesting. I think, I mean, most people now think there'll be no May election. That's the one takeaway. Um, a Labour cabinet minister said to me just uh, very recently that uh, they, I now can't see a May election. Um, I've often thought it's been a Labour roost to try and... Uh, to convince the voters and other, people, other electorate more widely um, that uh, there's no way that the, the, the Tory party is going to hang on to an office after May. But if I think now we can look towards a November election. I was struck also by the fact that the Chancellor said three times we can't have economic growth fuelled by migration. At the same time as the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, increased the forecast of net migration to this country up from 245,000 to 315,000 a year. So that's quite interesting. Where will that growth come from? Will, can they get those people sitting on, in, on, on out of work benefits into work? That's a key challenge. Um, earlier I spoke to Philip Hammond, Lord Hammond of Runnymede. He's the former Chancellor, about whether he thought this was a Conservative budget. Here's what he had to say to me. Yes, I think it was. It was cautious. Uh, it was clear in signalling the future trajectory, which is about um, lower taxes, increased productivity as being the solution to this conundrum about, on the one hand, how we fund public services and, on the other hand, how we get taxes down. And we heard there they might try and bring together or even abolish national insurance in the future. Is that something you looked at when you were Chancellor? No, it isn't. Um, I'm quite wedded to the principle of national insurance contribution. I think the contributory principle is important in our tax system. Um, but getting it down as an incentive to people to be in work is important. And the Chancellor made the point, I don't think by coincidence, at the beginning of his speech, um, that we can fix our economic growth problem by seeing more migration, or we can fix it by getting some of the 10 million adults who are not working at the moment back into the workforce. And that's the route he's chosen to follow. And that's a challenge which it seems that successive 
Tory governments have failed to deal with, this increasing number of people not working uh, and, on be and on benefits. I think Philip Hammond was interesting there. I talked also to Norman Lamont, Lord Lamont of Lerwick, and he, he went back to when he was Ch Chief Secretary of the Treasury, worked with Nigel Lawson. The idea of getting rid of, uh, of, um, a of, of, of the non-DOM status was one that was looked at by Lawson, and now it looks like delivered by Jeremy Hunt. And interestingly, uh, the PM, Rishi Sunak, had to recuse himself, withdraw from any chat about that, because his wife, Akshata Murti, is a non-dom and she pays tax in the UK on her global earnings. There's a challenge here for the Labour Party. Where will they find the money for their various plans they've got? Because the non-dom tax status being axed um, had been a, a, a key way of, of them spending, of finding, raising money quickly to spend on their priorities if they win power. So it does present challenges to uh, the Keir Starmer. The question now is, can a tax cut of 4% of national insurance in just three months increase the party's very low standing in the polls? That's the Tory party. We'll wait and see. That's the big question. Thank you. As ever, Chris Hope there live from Parliament. And I'm joined now by now Michelle Jubry, who, of course, to tonight basically. in Whitehaven, yeah, in six Whitehaven till seven, you know, is Jubes and Co. Jubes, are you there? Good evening. Yes, indeed, I am. Look at this. They've let me out and about, Martin. What an absolute treat. I love it when they do that. So, yes, we've got a packed audience full of the lovely people of Whitehaven. And what we're going to talk about, well, there's only one story in town, isn't there? That, of course, is the budget. I want to unpick it all. I want to ask people, what did you think today? Is it something that makes you happy? Is your life going to be better as a result? Was there anything in there for you? What was missing? What should have been in there? I found some of it absolutely fascinating, Martin. This uh, windfall tax, many people would say, should have been extended to banks. I want to get into that. The capital gains situation, many people want capital gains now to be changed, to be more in line with income tax. Of course, this budget went completely the other way. I've got Aaron Bastani and Mark Littlewood as well, keeping me company. One of my panel says, pack it in. Having all of these frequent budgets, just have one budget per parliamentary term. Also, they say, get rid of the OBR. And last but not least, I've got to ask the question, what on earth was that all about, starting the budget with this whole memorial uh, for the Muslim community in the World War? Is that a needed, necessary step to help bring people together or not? Well, Michelle Juba, that sounds like a cracking show. And I've got to say, we've had the director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies on the show. We've had lords, ladies, big knobs, MPs. The only people that matter, Michelle, as you know, are the great oh, yeah. British public. Oh. <laughs> On that bombshell, well, on that yeah, Alan I mean, Partridge moment. One of your uh, descriptions there did make me chuckle. Cool, blimey. But, uh, yeah, everyone is getting involved. I think that's the message. <laughs> Michelle Jubilee made me blush. That takes I some doing. I washed my mouth out before six o'clock. <laughs> All right, let's get back to serious stuff, because it is a serious day. Michelle Juby, 6 till 7, live from Whitehaven. Of course, after that, 7 is Nigel Farage. Now, we'll have much more reaction to today's budget between now and 6 o'clock. And, of course, you can get lots more of that story on our website. And thanks to you. Jubies.com is the fastest-growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all of the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. Now it's time for the latest Great British Giveaway and your chance to win 12,345 quid, one, two, three, four, five in cash and a whole host of seasonal treats. And here's how you can get your mitts on all of those goodies. We're springing into spring and giving you the chance to win the seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won, plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package to enjoy, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For your chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 45 pounds in tax-free cash text gb win to 84902 text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to gb03 po box 8690 derby de1 nine double t uk only entrance must be 18 or over lines close at 5 p.m on friday the 29th of march full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand good luck Great stuff. Now, as we expected, Jeremy Hunt has cut national insurance by 2p in the pound. But is that enough to help hard-working people who are struggling to make ends meet? We'll have all that coming up. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel.
Anna Aquir. Weekends from 3 p.m. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictively went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a cruise that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the King was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I've, uh, throughout all these families, I see it on a, on a day-to-day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Hmm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word, so inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussex's stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the king is ill, Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father as far as we know, and Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.22. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, today is the 40th anniversary of the start of the miners' strike. And later this hour, I'll cross to Sheffield to get reaction from former miners to the budget. Looking forward to that. Now, Jeremy Hunt has cut national insurance by 2p for the second time in just a few months. But with the country facing its highest tax burden for more than 70 years, is that really enough to ease the pressure on millions of families across this country? Well, let's speak now to Robert Palmer, who's the CEO of Tax Justice UK. Robert, welcome to the show. So we started the day with the highest taxes since World War II. We ended the day with the highest taxes since 19. 19- 48 2p from national insurance is all fine and well but fiscal drag is getting more and more people into higher tax brackets robert palmer we just have to face it we might as well face it they're addicted to tax (laughs) good afternoon and great to be with you um yes it's really interesting you know the chancellor talks a, a good game about cutting taxes but as you point out overall taxes are going up um, you know, and the, the cuts that he announced today, they're worth about eight pounds for the average worker, eight pounds a week. Um, you know, given rising prices, that's not really very much. Um, you know, I think this this really feels like a sort of cut and run budget, some some headline sugar rush high of tax cuts. But what's baked in coming down the line are spending cuts. And if you go out, you know, we have roads that are covered in potholes. People have to wait often years for an NHS appointment. Um, I had a friend who had to drive 45 minutes to register for a dentist and he thought himself lucky. You know, this country is falling apart and eight pounds a week extra 
extra in your pocket isn't really going to do it. So we need to see proper investment to turn our country round. And, you know, and I think if you look out there and talk to people, look at the polls, people aren't buying what Jeremy Hunt has to offer. What's interesting, Robert, people are very, very canny. They're very, very savvy. We've had hundreds and hundreds of emails come in today and people are saying, what did we expect? Now, they spent £400 billion on furlough, on lockdowns. We ostensibly bankrupted the economy by paying people to not work. That, could, that couldn't be on the never-never. Now we're having to pay it back. And as a consequence, people are being punished for what the government did during lockdowns. Well, I mean, what you can see is, you know, really significant underinvestment across the country, and that's a real problem. Obviously, we had COVID, which meant that lots of countries like ours had to spend more money. But if you look across the Atlantic to the US, they have some of the highest growth rates out of rich countries. And have they done that? That's because they've invested in their future. Um, you know, they've invested to have a clean and secure energy supply. Um, they've invested to support people. And that's not what we're doing in this country. So yes, we've got some big challenges we're facing, but there is an alternative where we, you know, properly fixed our failing public services and our lack of investment in this country, um, rather than handing out this measly eight pound a week uh, bung in a tax cut, which I don't think is going to change anyone's mind or really have that much impact on their pockets, given uh, high levels of inflation and the cost of living crisis. Yeah, I think you're bang on the money there. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, Robert Palmer, the CEO of Tax Justice UK. You're dead right. People are saying this was tepid. They expected a big firework and instead they got a damp squib. Well, GB News is the People's Channel and we want to hear from people all over the UK, not just in the Westminster bubble. So let's cross to Edinburgh now and speak to our Scotland reporter, Tony Maguire. Tony. So it was a budget of winners and losers and unfortunately one of the losers is the subject we've been looking at here in Scotland all day today, the hospitality sector. We were expecting that all-important VAT cut, a return to the pandemic times where it was reduced all the way down from 20 to 5 before re rising to 12.5 and then to 20. So I'm joined by Leon Thompson, Executive Director of UK Hospitality Scotland. How are you feeling after today's budget? Uh, incredibly disappointed. Um, my members and businesses right across hospitality will take today's budget as a, uh, a really heavy blow um, against their uh, economic fortunes. Um, we really needed to see movement on VAT today. We've been campaigning really hard to get a reduction to 12.5%. Businesses have really joined together in that call. We know that the public has supported that call to reduce VAT as well. The fact that it hasn't happened uh, will leave many businesses uh, today wondering what their next moves will be. Um, we know that many businesses are in a very difficult situation financially. Uh, VAT would have helped them. Uh, a reduction in VAT would also have unlocked uh, growth and investment in the, in the medium term. Our businesses can't do that. Our businesses can't move forward. We're locked in a spiral of uh, high costs and uh, we businesses have, uh, have nowhere to go um, after today's budget. We heard a little bit about um, some VAT help for, for small businesses. I believe there's a rise from uh, 85 to 90,000, but that's not going to help the, the businesses in Scotland, particularly the medium, medium and large sized businesses who are really getting squeezed because, there, of course, there are no business rate relief here in Scotland for them either. That's right. I mean, this budget obviously comes hard on the heels of the Scottish Government's budget in December, which uh, gave us nothing as well. We didn't get the 75% rates relief which our businesses in England uh, are currently enjoying and will enjoy um, into, into next year. Uh, we lost close to 400 hospitality businesses in Scotland last year. Uh, we may be um, destined to lose more um, in the coming months. Uh, many businesses just can't uh, continue with the, uh, the, the increasing costs that, uh, that they're facing and being expected to manage. Now, we are a resilient sector. Um, businesses have shown that time and time again, uh, particularly businesses in Scotland, um, you know, they will be digging in, they will be digging in hard and, uh, you know, continuing to deliver those great, uh, those great experiences to, to their customers. But, uh, you know, we, we've, we've had no support through from the UK government today and that chimes in with the lack of support that we received from the Scottish government in December last year. 
Well, those 400 businesses that were lost last year, well, they may be followed by more. So a recent survey shows that around 9% of Scottish hospitality leaders fear that their business won't last to the end of 2024. Um, but a resilient sector will need to wait and see. Um, and hopefully the festivals like the Fringe, which is held here on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, will play their roles in that. Thank you, Tony. Live there in Edinburgh and loads of emails coming out. We'll read a few of them out. Very, very passionate. You guys really, really know your onions. Neil says this. What about those of us who were forced into retirement because the lockdowns destroyed our business of over 30 years? We're 62 and we don't get a pension. We try to get by on our savings and the interest we receive. We still pay tax, but don't pay national insurance anymore. So please tell us. What's in it for us? And here's another one from Ken. Again, bang on the money, Ken. What do people expect after a pandemic that costs £400 billion for furlough and vaccinations? None of that money was for free and had to be paid back. And quickly one here on that topic of a £1 million cash handout to build a war memorial for Muslims. Carol says this. I always believed that all soldiers were equal. We have a memorial in our town with Muslim names on it already. So why on earth are we now spending a million pounds for a separate memorial just for Muslims? Carol, it's a great point. Please keep those views coming in. GBviews at gbnews.com. And there's loads more still to come between now and six o'clock. And I'll ask what difference the brand new so-called British ISA will make for savers. But first, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you. Let's just bring you some breaking news coming to us from Yemen. We're hearing that two sailors have died after a Houthi missile attack on a vessel in the Red Sea. We know that attacks on commercial shipping in that region have been a problem over the last few months. Uh, the latest details that are coming to us suggest three other crew members are missing and a number of others are seriously injured. We understand 20 people were on board at the time of the Houthi attack. In a statement on social media, the British embassy in Yemen has gone on record saying it was the sad and predictable result of a reckless missile launch. The rebel group, backed by Iran, has claimed responsibility for that attack. We understand the ship is now reported to be on fire and drifting at sea. So that news just into us, of course, will bring you more on events in those commercial shipping lanes near the Red Sea, uh, on the Red Sea, rather, in our next hour of news. Well, the other big story today, of course, the spring budget and a mixed bag of spending and reforms, as the Chancellor announces, it'll let people, people keep as much of their own money as possible. He said the government's fiscal performance means the economy will grow this year by 0.8%, but he said the government will cut national insurance. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. And self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. It means an additional £450 a year for the average employee or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. Well, also in the spring budget today, a new ISA scheme has been announced, aiming to encourage more investment in Britain, with an additional £5,000 limit on that one. There's also a five pence cut to fuel duty, locked in for another 12 months. We also heard IT systems in the NHS will be upgraded. And for businesses, there's a change to the VAT registration threshold. That's up from 85000 a year to 90000 a year. Plus, in a move to boost the British pub. The Chancellor also extended the freeze on alcohol duty. Now, funding some of the government's spending will be a new duty on vaping, while taxes on tobacco are said to go up and the windfall tax on oil and gas profits will also continue until 2029, raising around £1.5 billion for the government. The Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, said the Chancellor's budget shows that Britain's credit card 
is maxed out. We'll have more analysis on the budget for you throughout the evening right here on GB News. And for the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan that QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And how has the spring budget had an impact on the markets? Well, the pound will buy you $1.2753 and €1.1690. The price of gold is £1,683.08 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed for the day today at 7,679 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Great stuff. Now, we are, of course, the People's Channel. And in a few minutes, I'll find out what the good people of Sheffield think about today's budget. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. People in this field and... and and they talk about mental health assistance. And I know from personal experience within my own family circle mm. that the help is just not there. I know that with speaking to many families who've got autistic children and adults, they are really struggling at the moment, whether it's to do with education, getting a diagnosis, you know, once they get to 18 to 25, where's the help? There isn't the help there with social care. You know, I just set up a petition as well, who's going to look after my sons when I'm no longer around? Because that's what parent, that's the story and the question that's at the back of every parent's mind. It's just so hard at the moment and lots of small charities are closing. And for me, they're the backbone of the society because they're the ones that speak, you know, to parents continually all the time or autistic adults. So. And why has it to be that way? And, you know, we'll get government minister after government minister coming on and saying, we, we have greatly added to the resource here. We've had another two and a half people we've hired last year and whatever. I mean, they, they twist statistics and they make it all sound good. But I know from the work I do in the charitable world and I know from people who I, I know personally, it just isn't there. So stop telling it, it it is. And the thing is, the demand for mental health care has just woo, ballooned. Well, the earlier you start working with children who are autistic, the better the outcomes. I've seen it myself, and I know it with my own sons. I shouldn't have had to set up a school and remortgage my home, you know, for my boys. And so many parents are still struggling, like, 20-odd years from when my boys were diagnosed. And it's, they're saying it's improving, it's improving, and we're talking about awareness, we're talking about acceptance. It's hard mm. because I'm juggling caring, I'm juggling, you know taking him to college, picking him up, you know, I'm running a charity, I'm doing events. I know I'm a workaholic, but I'm very passionate and I'm very driven. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Brand new Sundays from 6pm. The Neil Oliver Show. It's absolutely vital that people are given the opportunity to take part in the debate, to say the things that matter to them, uh, to be challenged. A country is only really a shared dream. As long as enough people have a shared idea of what it is, then that country exists. What GB News does is give voices somewhere they can be heard. The Neil Oliver Show. Sundays from 6pm on GB News.
Welcome back. 5.39 is the time. You're watching all listening to Martin Daudney on GB News. Now, we've got a real treat for you on GB News this evening because after I knock off for the evening at 6, Jubes & Co will come live from the town of Whitehaven at 6 o'clock. And that's followed at 7 o'clock by the big man, Farage. Yes, Nigel Farage will also be broadcasting live from Whitehaven in front of a live TV audience outside of the bubble, talking to real British people for their immediate reaction to this budget that's what the people's channel is all about and you will not want to miss both of those shows now we've heard from tory labor and lib dem mps throughout this show but of course we're not just talking to politicians today we want to know how the budget will affect people in the real world well our yorkshire and humber reporter anna riley has been getting reaction from the wonderful people of sheffield we are here at Renishaw Miners Club near Sheffield, getting reaction to the budget announcement from the Chancellor, but also marking the 40 years since the strikes began on March the 6th, 1984, and how the closures of the pits in communities like this one in South Yorkshire have had a lasting impact. I'm joined now by Pauline. She is a miners' widow. Pauline, what do you make to the budget and, and what do you think it'll do to former mining communities like this one? Right, 40 years ago miners came out on a strike. They went back to work, not because they broke the spirit, they never did. They broke them financially. And in 12 years this government's been in, they brought this country to its knees. And today's budget makes no difference. Because where there's great power, there is great corruption, and this government's corrupt, and it's doing nothing for this country, nothing whatsoever. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you for sharing. We're also joined by David. He was a miner for 31 years in South Yorkshire. David, what do you make to what's been said in the budget? Well, first of all, it was a rabble. I hope no children watching it because it did affect their behaviour. Uh, national insurance, what he's mentioned, is dropping two, two pence. Uh, two percent. I hope he realises that the pensioners this year who would have got the pension who won't be getting it because he's raised the pension age. They'll be paying for that two pence, so he's giving us nothing. He mentioned something about house building. I hope he's going to build social housing, not private housing. Houses to rent so that, you know, there's something for people who can't afford that massive deposit and that massive mortgage. Uh, other than that, he gave a lot of money away, so ideally it's an election-winning budget and people are so short-sighted in this country, two pence in the pound off the national insurance just might swing it for him. Would it persuade you to vote Tory? It wouldn't, it wouldn't, nothing in the world would persuade me to vote Tory, but, you know, never say never, but I think I'll say never. Thank you, David. We're also joined by Chris. He was a miner for 10 years in South Yorkshire. Chris, what do you make to the government's budget announcement and what do you think to the impact on communities like this one? Well, every time the Conservatives are in charge, the impact always hits our communities. Uh, they never ever for the working man. It's always look after the rich. And it always will be with the Conservatives. Uh, I watch it to a certain degree, but everything they say to me, uh, there's a load of lies to what they come out with, they promise. And all they're promising for is when the election comes, they want in votes. Well, they're not going to get my vote, and they never will. Uh, I brought up as a Labour fan, I'll stick with Labour. Uh, Conservatives for me, uh, sorry, no way. Thank you, thank you for sharing, Chris. And we are now joined by George. George, you were actually arrested and imprisoned as part of yeah. the action that you took in, in the miners' strikes. What's the, the lasting legacy here, and, and what do you make to the government? Would the budget today make you want to vote Conservative? It's just total lies, as usual. It does not make a difference to a normal working person, basically. It's off, it just makes a difference for people's already loaded should i say i mean they're not about normal working person in the street they're on another planet to what we are they're not bothered about us not bothered about nurses nhs nothing don't make no changes and do you think labor or another government could do any better well i think i can do better to be honest it's it's it's, it's, it's just what can i say the things that this government's done is is not acceptable it's, it's not it's not for working person let's just say that thank you i mean also 
people's now they're expecting people to work while they're 70. That's all right if you're not if you if you're in a job that's not manually hard. Well, that's okay. But most people I know are knackered by the time you get to 50, let alone these silly ages to come into an hour. Thank you, George. So that's the view here from Renishaw Miners' Welfare on the budget and also 40 years on from the miners' strikes. You know, I find that incredibly moving. Um, my dad was down the pit 47 years, and anybody who watched this show regularly will know I'm incredibly proud of that. And to, to see these communities um, just abandoned by all political parties since the era of the pit shut in, and you can see the devastation there. David, Chris, George and Pauline, Miner's widow, feeling politically homeless, feeling exasperated, feeling left behind, behind those industrial heartlands, not just coal mining, of course, but steel mining in Sheffield. Nothing ever replaced it. These towns became cities and towns as dumping grounds for social problems, just left to fester. A lot of those mining communities, I have to say, when I campaigned in the 2019 general election, they did for the first time vote Conservative because they wanted to get Brexit done. How those people vote this time round will decide this general election as it did in 2019. And will you people out there who voted for the Conservatives in that election stick by your guns? Will today's announcement from Jeremy Hunt be enough to convince you? It has to be said, in the hundreds and hundreds of emails I've had in today, let's just say, the reaction has been tepid, not quite enough to convince. Are we at the point where the country is ready for change, or can the Conservatives still pull that rabbit out of a hat? Could there be another financial moment before the general election? Every expert today is saying it won't be May now, it's more likely going to be later in the year. Could a big firework, an income tax cut, for example, be enough to tempt you, or are you just sick of it all now? A lot of people feeling politically homeless, but today was an attempt to steer the ship back onto common sense ground. Has it convinced you? Please get in touch, gbviews at gbnews.com. I just love that broadcast. I love what this channel stands for, getting out there, talking to ordinary people outside of the Westminster bubble. Now, 14 million people have a mortgage, so I'm going to find out what was in today's budget for them. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Hello and welcome to the GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Some western parts of the UK are being treated to warm spells of sunshine today, cloudier further east and relatively chilly with a breeze from the North Sea. That is bringing some low cloud in as this high pressure to the east. Across eastern Scotland and northeast England, along with some drizzly rain, particularly over eastern hills. But further west, we've got those sunny spells, although showers are turning up across Cornwall and cloud has been hanging around for western parts of Northern Ireland. Now that edges away overnight, clear spells here, clear spells also for western Scotland, Wales and the southwest, where we do get the clear skies. Well, there'll be a touch of frost here and there and some freezing fog patches. But further east, the low cloud sticks around overnight and in fact it will be bringing a lot of mist and oh, hill fog to northern parts of England and eastern Scotland. We keep that going through the morning tomorrow, but then eventually it lifts. And as the cloud lifts and as temperatures rise, there will be some sharp showers developing, particularly in an area through the Midlands, East Wales, perhaps southern parts of England through the afternoon. Warm in the south and southwest, 12 to 14 Celsius, staying chilly along that North Sea coast. Friday brings further cloud to eastern parts of the UK and some patchy cloud further west as well. But it's a drier day on the whole, most places getting away without any rainfall on Friday. Same can't be said for the weekend. Outbreaks of showery rain move north across the country, although it stays mild in the south. I'm Tom Harwood. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 5.49. We're on the final furlong, but you're still watching to, or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, more than 14 million people in the UK have mortgages, and I'm one of them. No doubt, may, maybe you are too. But with households across the country struggling with soaring interest rates, first-time buyers are struggling and struggling renters are expecting much more from today's announcements. But for many... The spring was dropped in the budget for British housing. Well, I'm joined now in the studio in Westminster by Mark Bogard, who's the chief executive of the Family Building Society. Welcome to the studio, Mark. A lot of people were expecting big things today, Mark, on housing. We have a critical shortage of affordable housing. Young people in particular all the time get in contact with us and they cannot even dream of getting on the property ladder, but there are scant crumbs of comfort today. There were three tiny, completely irrelevant measures uh, that Jeremy Hunt announced. Housing policy in this country is a complete shambles. It's one of the most important fundamental things to people. Every night when you go to bed and every morning when you wake up, we've had 25 housing ministers in the UK in the last 26 years, nine Labour, 16 Tory, so they're both as bad as each other. It should be one of the great offices of state, and we need a coherent housing policy, not tweaks on CGT. And so what's the problem? Is it nimbyism? We hear a lot about soaring immigration, supply demand issues, as a consequence, soaring rents. How do we fix this? It's incompetent government and oversight of housing policy. So Housing is touched by nine different departments. They often pull in completely different directions uh, when they do good things. So one of the big successes of COVID, there were two, the um, uh, vaccination programme and then the stamp duty holiday. So the stamp duty holiday materially increased liquidity in the housing market, which gets people using homes better, optimising homes, and it raised more money for the Treasury. So what did they do? They stopped it. And it, it, we just don't understand why people would do that. But then when you talk about the positive effects of lockdowns, we've had loads of emails today from people saying the negative effects is billions and billions and billions of pounds spent on furlough and the vaccines. And as a consequence, we are now financially on our knees and now it's payback time. Yep, that's absolutely right. And the country's got poorer. It got poor as a result of the financial crash in 2007, got poor as a result of COVID and it got poorer as energy prices went up. But that's why when you have a success like the stamp duty holiday, which got people moving, you know, if they're having a new family or moving for their job, you had this great success, which Rishi Sunak introduced to generate more economic activity. It raised more money for the Treasury than they lost through cutting stamp duty. They stopped it and now they're tweaking CGT. It just doesn't make sense. So even when you have a success, you walk away from it. And, and you know, is there any way out of this? Or do you think, I mean, we, we hear about more social housing is required, but we've heard it over and over and over since the 80s. That's why you need a housing minister with real stature who's there for a period and you need a body to sit over and watch housing policy. So there's a climate committee now which watches over that. There's the OBR which watches over the finance. There has to be a housing 
policy committee that watches over this and judges their homework. Otherwise, they'll just keep failing. OK, Mark Bogart, thank you very much for joining us in the studio. I want, to, I want to finish today's show with a few emails, if I could. It's been hundreds and hundreds of you getting in touch. Listen to this. Peter says this. If the following had been included in the budget, then I feel that it would have moved the dial for the Tories. If Hunt had said all benefits handouts to illegal migrants will save £14 billion, which in return would allow us to give everyone a tax cut and stop the pull factor for boat crossings, that would have got my vote. Sue says this, our pensions are rising and that's good, but my rent has gone up nearly £8 a week, plus my council tax has gone through the roof, my water bill has risen, my rented garage has gone up and my phone contract's gone up almost five quid a month. So the extra 50, £59 a month increase has all been swallowed up. It'll have no effect on me. Brenda adds this, and um, the reason many pensioners will be angry about the budget is when the pension is increased in April, they'll be dragged into paying tax. The dreaded fiscal drag, of course. The Chancellor should have increased the tax thresholds. He's actually making many, many pensioners worse off. And finally, um, we've got another one here. I'm 75 and dependent on my state pension. This is from William. I have a good life. I have a car and I smoke a pipe. But the reason I have a good life is because I have, I have no debt. So I've done my bit. The country has let me down. Don't forget, we've got Jubes & Co coming up straight after this, live from Whitehaven. And we've got Nigel Farage, 7 to 8, also live from Whitehaven. Talk to real people. That's what we do on this channel. But first, it's time for your latest weather forecast with Aidan McGibbon. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Some western parts of the UK are being treated to warm spells of sunshine today, cloudier further east and relatively chilly with a breeze from the North Sea. That is bringing some low cloud in as this high pressure to the east. Across eastern Scotland and northeast England, along with some drizzly rain, particularly over eastern hills. But further west, we've got those sunny spells, although showers are turning up across Cornwall and cloud has been hanging around for western parts of Northern Ireland. Now that edges away overnight, clear spells here, clear spells also for western Scotland, Wales and the southwest, where we do get the clear skies. Well, there'll be a touch of frost here and there and some freezing fog patches. But further east, the low cloud sticks around overnight and in fact it will be bringing a lot of mist and oh, hill fog to northern parts of England and eastern Scotland. We keep that going through the morning tomorrow, but then eventually it lifts. And as the cloud lifts and as temperatures rise, there will be some sharp showers developing, particularly in an area through the Midlands, East Wales, perhaps southern parts of England through the afternoon. Warm in the south and southwest, 12 to 14 Celsius, staying chilly along that North Sea coast. Friday brings further cloud to eastern parts of the UK and some patchy cloud further west as well. But it's a drier day on the whole, most places getting away without any rainfall on Friday. Same can't be said for the weekend. Outbreaks of showery rain move north across the country, although it stays mild in the south. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We have a ton of top prizes to be won in our spring giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Whoever wins it next is going to...